Okay, good evening everybody and a very warm welcome uh, to those attending this evening uh, and also our viewers watching on the Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon London. My name is Councillor Steve Tuckwell and you are part of the Major Planning Applications Committee this evening. Um, details of business to be considered today is shown on the agenda, copies of which are available in the room and it's also accessible online underneath the live broadcast. For those present in the room and intending to speak, please note that you will be filmed and any statements you make will be recorded and made public. For those solely observing in the room today, you may wish to know that the camera is, ang camera is angled away from the public gallery from where you are sitting. A reminder to everyone speaking today that your voice will only be audible uh, on the microphone is switched on and I will ask that uh, the acoustics in this room can sometimes be quite a challenge so can you just please make sure you get your your uh, comments as close to the microphones so that other people can in the room can hear. In terms of a uh, fire alarm we are not expecting a fire drill this evening so if the fire alarm does go off please follow officers to the fire exits and out of the building to the designated meeting points where you'll be directed. For mobile uh, devices and tablets, for those in the room, please switch off any mobile devices before the meeting starts or put them onto silent. Can you please note that councillors on the committee may use their laptops or tablets during the meeting to view the agenda items in front of us. For declarations of interest, please ensure that you identify which item you have an interest in, state whether your interest is pecuniary or non-pecuniary and give the reason why you have an interest. Members do not need to declare an interest for an item of the agenda where they have already listed an interest on the register of interests. Furthermore, you do not need to declare an interest just because you are a ward councillor uh, for any item that uh, is in front of us. So thank you for, uh, for those attending and thank you for those that are watching us on the YouTube channel. Before we get into the other matters on the agenda, I do need to be reading out a short statement as there has been some changes to the configuration of planning meetings. So planning committees play a crucial role in providing democratic and transparent decision making on what can sometimes be controversial issues. Because of significant resources involved in each meeting, it is important that they focus on the applications of the utmost interest to residents. At the Council's AGM on the 20th of May, various changes were made to the committee structures. The Central and South and North Planning Committees were replaced with a minor planning applications committee and the HS2 and Major Applications Planning Committees were combined into the Major Applications Planning Committee. There have also been some changes to the membership of the committees and some minor changes to the officer scheme of delegation. Full details of the changes can be found by viewing the 20th of May full council agenda on the council's website. Okay, that's a short statement that I needed to read out. We can now get into the main body of the agenda, but before I do that, I'm going to introduce the people that are in the room this evening. And for those people that are uh, members of the public that are here, petitioners and applicants, but also for those that are watching on the YouTube channel. So I'm gonna start off with, we've got uh, Councillor Higgins, my Vice Chairman, he's here this evening. Uh, I've got Councillor Philip Cawthorn, Councillor Jazz Dot, Councillor Janet Duncan, and Councillor David Yarrow. So those are the voting members on this evening's proceedings. We're also supported this evening by officers. Um, namely, I've got James Roger, Deputy Director of Planning and Regeneration. I've got Mandit Maholtra, the Strategic and Major Applications Manager. I've got Raj Alla, our Borough Solicitor. Ian Thine, uh, Planning Specialist and Team Manager. I've got Alan Tilley, Transport and Aviation Team Manager. Nicole Cameron, Principal Lawyer for Planning and Corporate Services. I've got Zenab Ismail, Major Planning Application Officer. And Steve Clark on my right, who's going to be looking after us this evening from Democratic Services. Okay, so that's all the introduction and the domestics. We can now move into the main body of this evening's meeting. So we'll start off with agenda item one, Steve. Apologies for absence. So we received formal apologies for absence from Councillor Chapman this evening. Okay, thank you, Steve. Agenda item two is declarations of interest coming before this evening's meeting. Any declarations of interest? Okay, agenda item three is to sign and receive the minutes of the previous two meetings. We had a meeting on the last major applications was on the 19th of May. And members might recall that we also had a very short meeting after full council of the 20th of May, which was to appoint myself as chairman and Councillor Higgins as vice chairman. So can I take those meeting minutes as agreed? Okay, good, we can move on to agenda item four which is all matters that have been notified in advance or urgent, there aren't any, and the order of business this evening will be conducted as published in the agenda. 
Agenda item five is to confirm that uh, items marked in part one or part two. All items this evening are in part one, so there are no private items this evening to be discussed. So that's all of the uh, housekeeping and chairman's announcements covered off. We can now get into the main body of the meeting, which is to discuss the very first application this evening, which is an HS2 application, and we're going to be supported this evening by Ian Thine and Raj Allah. So on that note, I think I can hand over to yourself, Ian, to talk us through the application. Over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Firstly, it's good to be back, um, away from those virtual committees, so thank you very much for that. It's good to see you all. Um, item number six um, is land to the east and west of Breakspear Road South. So this is the location plan in front of you now. Uh, it's southwestern end of the Ricelift Golf Course, um, and it's, uh, I'll come on to the actual works in a minute, but the red line boundary takes us across uh, the River Pin and over Breakspear Road South, and then um, south of the MSD facility, uh, just west of Breakspear Road. So the works for approval tonight, works number 161, uh, it's a railway partly in tunnel commencing by a junction with termination of works 115 and 11, passing north westwards and terminating at point 225 metres north of the junction of Harville Road. Uh, put that into some sort of plain English. Uh, tunnel portal at West Ryslip, and this takes us all the way to the viaduct that will be going over the Colne Valley. Uh, this work also includes the vent shaft over at West Ryslip, which has been to this committee before and has been approved. Uh, now, Essentially, these works are divided into two packages. Uh, due to the, um, the way that the HS2 needs to conduct its construction activity, they need to get some works uh, completed before others. Um, and part of their critical path is the, um, is the bridges over the River Pin and Breakspear Road South. And tunnel boring machine is due to uh, launch under West Ryslip at some point early New Year. Um, and this is the embankment work that sits next to that. So this is part of the works that basically that the rail, railway will run on. So that's application one, which is this one, which is River Pin Underbridge, Breakspear Road South Underbridge, the West Ryslip retained embankment, which is basically the grass works to take the, uh, the railway over the, over the, over the route, Gatemead Embankment, and the noise barriers associated with it. Application two, which is a future application, is the River Pin realignment. Uh, it needs to be realigned to, uh, to go under the new HS2 bridge. Uh, footpath U46, which follows next to the River Pin, and a flood compensation area. So the flood compensation area um, is there to uh, support the works that we're looking at tonight. So unfortunately, unlike normal planning applications, some of the mitigation associated with the works tonight will come at a later date before this committee. Um, it's just the nature of how this, um, how HS2 goes through the planning process as part of Schedule 17. So as I said, uh, this is constraint plan, it's all in the green belt, but um, for clarity, this has effectively been decided by Parliament that it will be going here, so the principle of development has been established through the HS2 Act. So what we're looking at tonight is the earthworks and the actual building works for the bridges. Now in terms of the uh, building works, uh, the committee can, uh, as the council is a qualifying authority, it may only refuse to approve plans or specifications for the purposes of this paragraph uh, that's paragraph 5 of uh, Schedule 17 under Part 2. Uh, on the ground that the design or external appearance of the building works ought to be modified to preserve the local environment or local amenity, to prevent or reduce prejudicial effects on road safety or on the free flow of traffic in the local area, or to prefer, preserve a site of archaeological or historic nature uh, and nature conservation value, and is reasonably capable of being modified or the development ought to and could reasonably be carried out elsewhere within the development's permitted limits. So essentially, if we've got problems with this development tonight, then we have to at least have an, un, uh, an idea as to how those problems can be mitigated. And that would be how we would change the embankments or change the bridges. Uh, in terms of the alignment, I'm not sure HS2 would be overly happy with us with moving the alignment. So to some extent, that is fixed, uh, and it's largely fixed by the previous works at the tunnel portal which was approved by this committee some time ago so um, it really is thinking about modifications if we do have issues with the, with the design or external appearance and that goes for the earthworks as well in terms of noise barriers uh, all we're interested in is whether or not they're actually going to do the job that was set out in the environmental statement and there's a noise demonstration report uh, with the bundle of paperwork submitted by HS2 
Uh, bird's eye view doesn't quite look like that now. This is a, um, sort of probably about a year old now. Um, but you can see uh, you can see roughly where the, the alignment's going to go. Uh, right across Brakeby Road South, and you can see the river pin there on the on the right of the screen, uh, and the golf course, which is now uh, officially closed, and will be subject to a separate application itself. Another location plan, but this time with the HS2 route on it, um, filling in the gaps in effect, and you can see it there running parallel with the uh, Chiltern Line, uh, crossing the river pin and Brakeby Road South. As I said, the works that we're doing, looking at tonight is the, effectively the embankments, so the, the, uh, the mounding of the earth, the green embankments that are taking the, um, taking the railway line up and over the River Pin. The River Pin itself is obviously a hard, uh, hard structure, big bridge, as well as Breaksbury Road South, uh, at which point it goes back into, uh, onto the, the embankments and then um, ultimately down into a green tunnel. So if we see that in a little bit more, more detail, you see West Ryslip Portal at the bottom of the right, uh, bottom right of the screen there. That was approved by committee. Uh, it all blends in these days, council with lockdowns and stuff. I'm not sure if it was last year or the year before, but um, it's been approved by the by the by this committee. Um, and then that moves into what we're looking at tonight. So that's basically package one was the portal. This is package two, which is separated into two separate parts, as previously mentioned. And then it goes into the Coptal Tunnel, which is a green tunnel uh, in between Breaksby Road South and, and Harville Road. Um, separate to that, because HS2 is taking up a lot of the land required for the golf course, uh, Rice Golf Course is being remodelled. That is the subject of a Town and Country Planning Act application, which is in the system at present. And you'll see a couple of uh, purple areas there as well, which is effectively the mitigation for the works tonight. So if we first deal with the River Pin Bridge as, it, um, as we move from east to west, the River Pin Bridge was uh, probably the largest uh, problem for this development. Uh, this is south of the golf course, which is obviously a recreational site, and we want it to maintain a recreational use once it's um, up and running. Got footpath U46 in this area. So it's quite, um, it's quite an interactive public area. It's a lot of residents use it, a lot of footpaths link up to the wider Con Valley and beyond. So um, we're keen to make sure that the structure itself recognizes that and allows us to um, keep some sort of amenity uh, for the residents in this area. And you can see at the top left there, you can see that the, the footpath and the rib pin going underneath the new, uh, new bridge. But importantly, you can also see to the south of that is the Chiltern Line Bridge. So effectively, you've got two bridges right next to each other. There's about just less than 30 metre gap between the two. So that's, that in itself is going to be a fairly oppressive environment once you have two bridges. So we, we, we'll come on to the landscaping at some point in due course. Uh, this is effectively standing underneath the new HS2 bridge looking along at the, the Chiltern uh, Line Bridge, uh, a nice built structure. You can see the river pin going through the archway on the right and U46, the footpath on the left. There's a bit of context. Uh, you can see the river pin realigned here to get under the new HS2 track um, and then the footpath U45 going to the U47 at this point as well. Um, it's quite a tight squeeze under this bridge, and we, that was some of the design implications that I'll come on to in a second. Um, contrasting the Chiltern brick-built bridge with two nice archways, uh, this was HS2's first attempt at the um, rice lip of the river pin underbridge. Uh, it's fair to say that HS2 have a, a fairly, um, fairly interest with, uh, with concrete a little bit of concrete and these were these walls were about eight to nine meters high so a fairly hefty structure alongside the footpath that has graffiti me written all over them which was the position of officers uh, hs2 had come up with a material of a sort of rib material that would uh, deter graffiti artists but officers obviously had the concern well it would also make it very difficult to clean it up so our position was some time ago this first came to the council well over a year ago now was that this was unacceptable uh, the designs as they stand now have improved slightly so there's a, a slight decrease in the height of the wing walls but the important thing about this application I'll just go back a couple of slides chairman is the alignment of the river pin uh, the river pin was causing a bit of a problem uh, to get the, the footpath next to the river pin under the bridge took up pretty much most of the room alongside the wing wall. This meant that there was no scope for planting. 
there's no scope for planting, then those wing rules are completely exposed to the public and anyone who wants to um, put their tag on it, or whatever they use say today. Um, so that would cause an extremely large problem for us and it would pretty much make the site, un, uh, make the area quite unsightly. So the aim was to try and get some landscaping next to that wing wall. But as I said, the problem was realigning the river pin and the footpath. The, it, it turned out that the river pin um, was being located where it was because of a temporary haul road that HS2 had put in north of the river pin. Uh, officers raised the concern with HS2 quite rightly. It said we're not having a, a temporary haul road impact on the permanent works for the river pin. So we've challenged HS2. They're actually now moving the, the haul road further north. That frees up more room so the river pin can come at a, at, at a less tighter angle. That allows the footpath more room to breathe and that gives us plenty of space for planting next to the wing wall. So whilst the landscaping is not part of this committee and not part of the approval today, what I can tell you now is that because of those works, we're in a position that we are now happy with the way that this, um, that this bridge has been presented to us. And remember, if we weren't happy with it, we would have to find ways to modify it, um, which is obviously fairly difficult for us to modify a high-speed uh, bridge over the River Pin. But we have managed to secure some mitigation a better design, which allows us to have that landscaping and improve alongside the, the golf course. So scooting back through. So that's, uh, after a good year's worth of work, that's got us into a position where officers feel like we can um, post a positive recommendation for this particular part of the, the site. Obviously, the landscaping will come at a later date, and we'll, we'll look at that in due course when it gets submitted as part of a bring into use application. Uh, just to complete the concerns that we had, this is sitting from the uh, sitting under the Chiltern Line uh, bridge as it stands at the minute, looking towards the new HS2 line. Um, this area in between is going to be a particular concern because uh, it's gonna actually going to be far darker and far more oppressive than this HS2 image will give us uh, gives us an indication of. You've obviously got the river to the left as well, which narrows the path. So two bridges side by side is going to be a fairly oppressive environment and not one that we um, would like people to be congregating. So this is going to be heavily landscaped. Um, we're working on with HS2 as to whether or not it needs to be lit. Uh, and there's going to be defensive planting. Uh, Network Rail as well also wants some hefty security fences in this area to stop people getting onto their tracks. So this area is about trying to get uh, a pedestrian from one bridge through to the next one into open ground as possible, as quickly as possible. But that will come on through the, the landscaping at a later date. But I just wanted to flag that up at this point. Um, the materials board that HS2 have promoted, um, there is some evidence that these are, uh, these do deter graffiti and it, and, and it is difficult to um, put your designs down, but ultimately the concern from the, the officers is that if they do get graffitied, how quick will they be cleaned up um, and what will it look like? We've obviously seen other types of infrastructure where concrete is just painted over and it looks awful. So we're still working that through with HS2 at this moment. Moving over to Breakspear Underbridge, uh, this is less complicated as this is simply just a, a new bridge over the Breakspear Road South next to the Chiltern Line Bridge. Um, there is a footpath that goes across the bridge, across the Breakspear Road South at this point, but the intention is that people will just move across the, this area quickly so that there's no congregation, there's no, there's no resting point here for residents. So the key is that um, the concern about design and, um, and appearance of this area is, is it's, it's not as prominent. I, I would challenge anyone to spend some time under this bridge in Breakspear Road South to try and graffiti it. I think they'll be taking their lives into their own hands. So there's less concern at this bridge, but nonetheless, it is a fairly hefty structure. You can see the amount of concrete again with the, uh, um, with the deck structure on top. Um, it will be fairly prominent and somewhat different from the Chiltern Line Bridge at the minute, Breakspear Road South. Um, Moving just a little bit further along, we've got the noise barriers. The noise barriers are particularly important at this point because they protect uh, uh, Brackenbury House, which is a Grade II listed building, and there's a scheduled ancient monument there as well. Um, but there are few residential receptors. But we've approved the similar type design for the noise barriers elsewhere on the route, particularly up, the, up to the um, tunnel portal. So again, officers have no concerns with the designs, and the noise demonstration report suggests that they're sufficient to do what Parliament said that they should do. Uh, so in terms of the earthworks cross-sections, you can just see the large-scale uh, 
embankment here. And just for those that are interested in how the material is getting here, this will, uh, as I understand it, although it's not part of the, what this committee can consider tonight, uh, this material will be brought in specially because it is a high-speed two viaduct or a high-speed two railway. So we have to be careful about the type of embankment that it actually, um, the material that goes into it. It's not uh, the stresses and strains of a 250 mile an hour train means that Unfortunately, most of this material has to be brought in bespoke, so that is one of the reasons why there's a lot of uh, lorries on the roads, which have been part of previous discussions at this committee, so I'm sure we can all remember. Um, so just to, just to complete that picture, um, soft landscaping plan, it's not overly relevant at this point because this will come as part of package number two, application number two, which will be the mitigation for this, along with um, the flood compensation areas uh, and obviously the river pin alignment as well. So just to complete, Chairman, in terms of the recommendation, the officer recommendation is for approval. There are three non-standard informatives on there. I won't read them out um, verbatim, but uh, essentially it is to um, putting on record our position in relation to the river pin and how it needs to be realigned. The second stand, non-standard informative is about graffiti management. We're still yet to be convinced that HS2 has a clear plan of that. Uh, so there's still work to be done on that before the scheme is brought into use. And under HS2 Act, a bring into use application has to be made for these works. So we'll raise that then if it's not sorted. And same with in non-standard informative number three as well about noise monitoring. Uh, obviously, as we, as we said previously on the tunnel portal, uh, the noise from HS2, it's new railway, it's unheard of in, in Europe. It's one of the quickest in, uh, one of the quickest in the world and it's all been modelled. And as we know, German modelling doesn't necessarily always meet reality. So uh, we want to be part of the noise uh, monitoring. We want to have that open and transparent, uh, and we want to secure that as part of any works coming forward as part of the bring into use application. So there we go, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, no further comments from me. No, thank you very much, uh, Ian, for, uh, for taking us through what is a very technical subject. Um, and I'm sure members will have a, a number of questions. But before we open the floor up to members, I'm going to invite Raj Allah to, uh, to give us um, some angles from a legal perspective um, that members will want to take into consideration before we ask any questions. So, okay, to yourself, thank, Raj. thank you, Chairman. Uh, very good evening to everyone. And I do apologise for the fact that I'm not facing you when I speak. Um, I'm afraid it's how this chamber has been configured and the location of the of the microphone, so um, apologies for that. Um, I hope that the training session which Ian and I provided for members on Monday provides some useful context for what I am about to say. And members may recall on Monday that I said that there is essentially a two-fold legal test which you need to uh, carefully look at when considering these types of applications. And the first such test really builds on these very well established Wensbury principles, which is used um, a lot in sort of common parlance. And what it means um, in simple terms is that a decision maker must have su sufficient information before them in order to make a reasonable and lawful decision. And um, I want to make reference to the Court of Appeals judgment which was handed down in July of last year. And that judgment was a bit of a landmark um, decision in relation to Schedule 17 applications. And what the Court of Appeals said is that a qualifying authority such as this council um, does not have any legal obligation whatsoever to determine a Schedule 17 application unless and until such time as High Speed 2 Limited have provided sufficient information in support of it. And this is an area which has been lacking and has resulted in officers making a number of recommendations that Schedule 17 applications are refused because there's simply insufficient information before the decision maker. I think we are working with High Speed 2 to establish a better working relationship and to try and paper over some of the cracks which have hitherto existed. So um, that is the first um, legal principle. And it is said in the report that officers consider that there is sufficient information 
in order for this application to be determined, but officers are not the decision makers, it is members. So members will need to satisfy themselves that they are happy that they have enough information. So that's the first part of the test. If that test is satisfied, you then have to go on to consider whether there are any uh, grounds for refusal. And this is not like normal town and country planning applications. The grounds for refusal are much more heavily constrained by the High Speed 2 Act, and you can only refuse uh, an application if one or more of the statutory grounds exist. I have set them out in my legal comments on pages 18 and 19 of the report, and I did reference them when I provided my training on Monday. And um, I don't really wish to read them out because I think that would just take unnecessary time. They are there, they are in print, and um, members will become familiar with them in the course of time. Um, but I can advise the, the committee that none of those uh, statutory grounds are engaged in this particular case, and um, conditions also can only be imposed on a, uh, an approval if one or more of those grounds exist, and for the same reasons um, the committee is precluded from imposing any conditions because um, the grounds simply do not apply. Now, Ian has referred to three non-standard informatives, which are on the screen ahead of you. And just to be clear, that informatives are something that are very different to conditions that have a much lower legal status than conditions. They cannot be enforced under the Town and Country Planning Act, and they are really there as matters of good practice, which we are requiring um, High Speed 2 Limited to observe. But I think we would all be mistaken if we were to um, say that the informatives simply had no purpose. Um, we are setting down a marker. They are a reminder to High Speed 2 Limited and indeed to the Council that these requirements, these matters should be um, observed. So they do have their own role to play, but they are something very different to conditions. They don't feature at all in the High Speed 2 Act and you're not precluded from agreeing the informatives in the same way that you are for agreeing conditions. So I think, Chairman, that's all I really wanted to, to add by way of legal comment. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Uh, very helpful. I, I would uh, suggest on behalf of the committee, and, and thank you to Ian, and thank you to yourself, Raj, for taking us through um, this application. So it's open to members now to, uh, to debate it. So who wants to... Councillor Higgins, you're indicating... Thank you, Chairman. It just, uh, it's just really, I know it's not really a planning, I just want to know when, we, when residents will know when the works will affect that road. Um, I don't know when that will be. Will they even be given enough notice that well, that road is going to be blocked off? Because at the moment it seems to be a free fall down there. One minute you're going down there and you can go down there and there's no problems. And like yesterday, it was, or Tuesday it was closed, today it's open. I, just want to know where we're going to get that information. Ian, can you pick that one up? Certainly, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, you're right, it's not part of this um, application for consideration tonight, but um, there is a, a significant programme of activity down there at the minute on Breaksbury Road South. Um, there's a lot of work's already gone on. There's a lot of work's to be <laughs> going on still. Um, there is a, a HS2 web page called Commonplace, where most of their programme work is uh, on and they do have uh, run information sessions for the residents who, who can ask questions and there are a number of um, groups that are engaged with HS2 to spread the word of the activities. It's fair to say that HS2 uh, need to get a bit better with their uh, information on the program that's coming up, particularly around road closures and things like that, but generally speaking there is a, um, there is a, a body of information out there if residents wish to uh, provide it or go and see it and I will happily provide you with the details afterwards, councillor, so that you can um, you can have the links and all the red, relevant information. Yeah, through you, Chair, yeah, that, that, uh, Chairman. Um, is that, if that's possible, would it be possible to have it on our website so our residents come to, to us to find out the information rather than trying to hunt it down? Uh, agreed. Um, that's something that we're looking at. Um, it's HS2 scheme and they are heavily resourced to do the engagement work 
um, and that's generally speaking how they prefer to do it. Um, notwithstanding that, there is a requirement for it, or there is a there is a use for us with residents to use our uh, to exploit our own connections and observations. The, the problem is then that we get all the questions about HS2 activity as well, which we're obviously um, keen to protect and support the residents. But ultimately, this is HS2 scheme, um, and they're responsible for. Uh, engagement as well as obviously sharing the information on their projects, some of which the council doesn't even know about. But um, I will certainly um, feed that back, councillor. Yeah, sorry to lay the point, Chairman. I, I, I appreciate that. I'm not asking for us to tell our residents when it's going to be closed, but to have that information that they can click onto it and look it up rather than. than yeah, the, yes, councillor, abso absolutely agree. We do have links on our website to those com commonplace websites but uh, and we are looking to do some more more co more communication through our own social media and um, to highlight what works are happening at the minute yeah that that might be well supported by members inquiry as well I think to get to get that in so on behalf of uh, everybody because it's a good point it is, it is a good point um, okay um, councillor Cawthorn you indicated I did and it's a, a question really coming on the back of what we heard from from the barrel solicitor there's a lot of background noise in here so I may not have po uh, heard correctly what, uh, what co was coming from Raj can I clarify something and this is on the point of graffiti management uh, what I've understood uh, from the borough solicitor is that it is not within our gift to do anything more than have the informative rather than the condition we, we simply can't do that uh, am I right Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cawthorn. Councillor Duncan? Thank you, Chairman. Um, on the same issue, really, I know we're not considering landscaping this evening, um, but I do hope that because these are huge chunks of concrete which will attract graffiti artists, I'm sure, far and wide. And um, I wonder if green walls had been considered as part of landscaping um, to partly cover part of this concrete because you have got embankments. Um, I know it won't be considered tonight, but possibly if that could be part of talks wherever practical, um, maybe we would like to flag that up. Um, the other thing, I know it's not something that's under our control, but you did mention about material being brought in um, uh, to form these embankments and as we are so close to the river pin and also groundwater in this area is it um, tested for contamination before it comes in because I can remember other examples of works um, uh, actually relating to the Hayes bypass when that was built and there were residential properties and uh, material was brought in and unfortunately for the contractors, one of the residents who lived there was a soil testing expert who quickly found that it was contaminated. Um, so I do hope that we can avoid anything like that, so that there's no contamination of groundwater. I realise this is totally under the control of HS2, but if we could please mention that, because we don't want to be wise after the event, if possible. Thank you. A couple of points there, then if you want to come back, any of those, Ian? No problem at all, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I'll start with the graffiti issue uh, and going back to Councillor Cawthorn's point as well. Um, we do intend to put a condition on uh, a later application, bring into use application. So uh, the way that the HS2 Act works is we deal with the designs at this point. Uh, at some point, though, in the future, they will have to come in. Uh, for a bring into use application under Schedule 17. That means they come to us and say, can we bring the, the, the scheme into use like we had on um, the access road to the MSD facility, which is now up and running. And as part of that, we intend to explore the options of graffiti management as well. Hopefully, it will be resolved before then through some form of uh, assurance or undertaking or some commitments from HS2 Limited. But if not, we intend to secure conditions on that HS2 may not like that, but that is our, our intention at this moment. So it's on them to hopefully resolve the issue before it gets to that stage. So that's, that's graffiti management. In terms of the green walls, we have discussed green walls with, um, with HS2 Limited because that that's um, one of the obvious and seems to be one of the cheapest ways to do it without having to change the realignment of the river pin. Um, but under the specifications for uh, the, the wing walls, they need to be clear for maintenance. 
that was the position that HS2 Limited presented to us. So nothing growing into the wall because then that might have a, an impact on the integrity of the, the structure, which causes the engineers some concerns. Now, whether that's overly cautious or not, that's HS2 Limited's position, uh, and we pushed them as far as we could on that, but that's their specifications. And at the end of the day, they are running a 250 mile an hour train on top of a you know, hefty structure, and if they're telling us that the, um, that the integrity of the wing walls might be compromised by the use of vegetation, then uh, to some extent that's, that, you know, that's their position, and we, we challenged it as far as we could. But um, the, ultimately, the option was planting in front of the wing wall to allow uh, or to create the space for planting in front of the wing wall. In terms of uh, materials being brought in and contaminated land, uh, it's not just down to HS2. There is a requirement for them to work with the Environment Agency as well. So any material that they brought in is, it's, it has to be sorted at one end and, and, and uh, made good, made clear. And it's, so it's inert material that's brought in. Um, it's also frustrating as well that they're digging out quite a lot of holes in this area and they're not using that material. Um, but as I said, this, the material that has to be brought in to form these embankments has to be of a particular standard and grade to um, take the strains of HS2. So whilst there are lots of material dumping sites in the borough, they will also be bringing in more material as well, which is uh, you know, um, 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 unfortunate and frustrating, but um, that's the situation. But in terms of the contaminated, the Environment Agency will ensure that anything that comes in, there is a process involved through the Code of Construction practice that makes sure that that is clean in uh, material. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, any other members indicating to speak? Okay, anybody want to take us forward on this one if there's no further debate? Councillor Duncan. Yes, I move officer's recommendation. Okay, thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Yarrow? Okay, so we are moved and seconded. Can I have a show of hands in favour of officer's recommendation? Steve, I'll take that as unanimous. So, okay, thank you very much. I can confirm agenda item six this evening is approved unanimously. Thank you very much for your participation on that. So we're going to take a, a very quick break now to allow Farage and Ian to depart and a little bit of um, chair swapping around uh, whilst uh, Mandip uh, and Zaneb get into position. So we'll just take a, a couple of moments uh, whilst we do a bit of internal logistics. Okay, that was a short, very short break to get uh, reorganised for the next item on the agenda this evening, which is the first of two petition items this evening. Um, and we're going to be now going over to agenda item seven, which is uh, the land off Harefield Road. Um, I think we're going to have a, a dual presentation uh, this evening between uh, planning officers. So are you ready to go, Mandip? Over to you. Thank you, Councillor Tuckwell. Item number seven is Guild Living. The application seeks planning permission and is recommended for approval for the redevelopment of the site comprising the demolition of the existing buildings, which are the Halfords and the Wicks store in Uxbridge. They are accessed via Harefield Road just here, adjoining the police station. The proposal will deliver commercial units at ground floor level. It will be a seven story building comprising C2 use classes. I am going to take you through the plans and Zenab, who has tirelessly worked on the planning application, I don't want to take all the glory, will be giving you an overview of the scheme itself. Um, so we have the location plan before us and a constraints plan. The application site, as you can see, is close to a number of, um, the brown indicates listed and locally listed buildings. So there are some buildings within the vicinity which are listed and locally listed in the site is within um, a parking management scheme. The conservation area, just to be mindful, is south of this um, 
this internal access road. So the application site is not in a conservation area. This is a generic site location plan. So these are the two stores which exist on site at present. And this is the generous car parking area located in front of the stores. These are plan or elevations of the existing buildings. So the existing Halfords and the Wick store. This is a proposed layout of the application site. So there are residential accommodation on parts of the ground floor supported by other older living care facilities which then will run through. We have a new public plaza, so this is a fully publicly accessible uh, square for residents as well as members of the public. It is surrounded by commercial uses at ground floor level and given that the application site is a town centre use, uh, the, town, the commercial uses are supported. There is no objection to the loss of the retail, um, so that's the Halfords and the Wicks and that's set out in the report and I'm sure Zenab will go into it in more detail. The site is accessed off Harefield Road. You access into the development site. There is some parking along the internal access road. The access road leads all the way through the site and comes out via Warwick Place. There is also an area of parking provided internally within the development site. So that's the only internal car parking within the application site. This is a more detailed general arrangement of the ground floor. We have a first floor plan, second floor, third floor. You'll see that the building has been set in here. As we go up the building, you'll see further settings of the built form. So this is the fourth floor, the fifth floor, and the sixth floor. And then just a roof plan. Take you through the site elevations. So we have uh, all four elevations. Obviously, there are multiple buildings on the site, hence the reason that this might look a little bit um, confused. But it is showing the context of the application site within its surrounding um, forms. And you can see some of the taller buildings within Uxbridge um, set in the background. The plan packs do have more detailed elevations, but this is just the site context. These are the sections of the proposed building, so you can see the stepped form of the buildings in order to take account of its existing surroundings. Further sections. Now this application, or sorry, not this application, the site has had a previous application refused for a, what we felt was a very, very substantial development. So I wanted to just cast our minds back. It is a few years old now, but it's worth noting that we, we resisted um, a development of this scale a number of years ago, and we've come in, uh, or we've got to a point where we feel we've negotiated a scheme that is of a, an appropriate scale for this town centre site. One other point to make, I know that the application site does have a shortfall in amenity space, and those are obviously um, calculated based on our standards. But if we look back to the previously refused scheme, the proposal wasn't a gated community per se, but it didn't have any public access. So the development provided a little bit of car parking for the proposed occupiers, and then an internal access road, which would only have been serviced um, or used by the future residents. The application site does have a shortfall in amenity space, but it is delivering a public open space, which is, which is of benefit to everybody um, and is a positive of the scheme. We have some, land, some initial landscaping details provided, so this was quite important to make sure that we were happy with the, the way in which the street, the internal access road, interacted with the public plaza, which is further south. We have um, the existing and the proposed. We are losing uh, trees on site. However, there is a replacement planting proposed um, in addition to some planting on what is adopted highway. I will now pass over to Zenab. Um, for the remainder of the presentation. Thank you, Mandy. So um, I won't go through the, what the proposal is again, but I will elaborate on the principles. Um, so the application caters, uh, or is designed to cater for those over the age of 65 requiring care and support. It provides communal um, facilities that will be accessible to residents. So Amanda, can I ask you to flick back to the general arrangement plan so I can explain to members the, the zero, zero general arrangement plan. 
Uh, so it's the next slide. Thank you. So um, at ground floor level, um, we've worked hard with the applicant to provide appropriate communal facilities. Um, these will be available to members of the public. So on the right hand side of the plans at ground floor level, there is a wellness center. It's going to be available for the residents of the development, um, but it will also be available to members of the public in the local area. We have mobility scooters. We have four, um, within each core, we have refuse stores so that residents do not have to walk beyond 30 meters to dispose of their waste. There is a restaurant and a cafe at ground floor level to the left of the open space. And the site is going to be managed um, by a member of staff. So they have a management suite there as well. And larger deliveries um, being provided at the site can be taken in at that point. Um, and that is the uh, service bay. So um, the larger deliveries will go into one of those rooms. So it, it, it's a well thought out scheme in that respect. Um, it, it includes active frontages along Harefield Road and it includes activity. The main entrance is at the Port Cushare, um, which opens out onto the public open space. So, um, various, yes, yeah, so it includes ver the, the other point to make is that um, the applicant seeks to provide a, a, a sort of community spirit and areas of social interaction. So it includes library therapy, treatment rooms, um, and it will run book clubs and activities for residents of the development um, to f facilitate and foster that community spirit within the development. Um, in a total of 18 disabled bays are being provided for residents. 15 of those spaces, um, uh, 15 additional spaces have been provided for staff, carers and other operational requirements, three of which are accessible. There are six, so if you flick over to the earlier plan, um, so the, there are six visitor spaces along uh, the road leading to Warwick Place. We have a dedicated refuse bay in front of the refuse store um, and there is various car, so the first space is a car club space and the second is a dedicated minibus space. So again, the applicant is providing a minibus to allow residents of the development because it is largely car free other than disabled spaces. It's allowing residents to make use of that minibus and arrange days out or shopping trips um, through, the, through the applicant and the development. Um, so whilst there is a loss of existing retail units, these units are not protected by planning policies and their loss will not result in harm to the viability and vitality of the town centre. The provision of specialist older persons accommodation will, uh, that is being provided here will contribute to the annual benchmark set by the London Plan on the London Borough of Hillingdon to deliver 180 per year, um, and this will make a significant contribution to that. Um, the applicant is providing 3 million and 78,000 in aff off-site affordable housing contributions. This was tested through a financial viability assessment, and on that basis, it was considered that this is the maximum reasonable amount that can be provided. Um, in terms of daylight and sunlight, the, the impact on neighbouring amenity has been fully considered and it concludes that the impact on neighbouring amenities is acceptable. Um, it also has looked at the existing, sorry, the future occupants and the, all of the residential units and the habitable spaces will benefit from good levels of light within uh, the development. Um, it, and this is where there's been minor transgressions, this is considered uh, appropriate in the context of this site and where seven storey buildings are provided. Um, the protection, yes, of neighbouring privacy has been fully mitigated, so there is a condition requiring further details of privacy screens, but the design itself has mitigated the impact on amenity through its orientation. Um, excluding, so whilst it's desirable to have private balconies, 
within this development, the applicant has had to exclude them to ensure there isn't that sort of perception of overlooking and overlooking um, into residential properties surrounding the site to the north and the northwest. Um, so following the amendments, the layout, scale, height of the proposal, it's considered this development is appropriate. It strikes an appropriate balance in terms of the height and scale of the town centre um, and the suburban context to the north of the site because as, it, as the development gets closer to the Harefield Road, um, it steps down to four storeys um, to respect that sort of townscape set setting. Um, do you want to flick onto the CGI's to demonstrate that? So this is an image. The applicant has set back their building, so initially um, it was projecting forward of um, the building line of the properties along Harefield Road, but actually now it's set slightly back and instead we have a green buffer and street, street tree planting, which will actually be managed by the applicant, so it won't incur further cost to the council um, and that's been secured uh, through 106. Um, where the trees are being lost, so at the moment there are 45 trees on site. Um, the applicant will be removing 27 of the existing trees, but they are also looking to provide an additional 69 trees, so that will bring the trees to 87. They've also provided details of the trees and I can confirm they are pollution absorbing. Um, I can also confirm that all ground floor residential units have buffer space um, around the habitable rooms so they will be provided with appropriate amenity. Um, I think that covers all the issues. The cycle parking is in line with the London plan. I just want members to note that there is there are three changes to conditions. So we've got an amendment to condition four, which um, is the description of development, and it is to ensure we include the use of C2 use class. Um, so it's clear that it integrates nursing care um, and the care use uh, within the development. Condition four has been amended so that no deliveries and servicing take place on Sunday and bank holidays. And 24, yes, and um, condition three, 33 has been added to include automated lighting for communal spaces and that is to ensure uh, there's a device in place that automatically turns off lights in rooms, communal spaces and rooms when they're not in use to uh, preserve energy and conserve energy. Right. Um, so on that basis, the following the very many amendments to the scheme, we believe that this has resulted in a high quality scheme. There are many planning benefits um, and a package of section 106 work which are detailed in the officer report. Um, we therefore recommend approval for this application subject to condition and conditions and legal agreement. I'm happy to take any questions members may have on this. There might be many. Thank you. Okay, is there a couple more slides you just wanted to maybe yeah, um, show there's members? Some, yeah, so if I can just flick through. So Warwick Place, this is this is the site as it is. So these are, uh, this is the CGI of Harefield Road. Here, I'll take over. Oh, thank you. So this is the internal, um, this is a CGI of the internal space. Uh, you can see that there's a podium level so we're looking at it from sort of southern elevation. This is the public open space being provided. That's the wellness centre, and then that's the podium level amenity space. This is the Harefield Road, and you'll see that the building has been stepped down to, it, to address that relationship with the residential properties, so it doesn't actually rise too much above the rooftop of the adjacent property. Um, and that's been considered appropriate in townscape terms. So this is the current uh, site, the entrance to the site looking east. This is the relationship currently with the police station and this is primarily where the 
uh, internal access road will go. At the moment, there's two-way entry for vehicles. This will actually be a one-way system going forward where vehicles will drive in and then exit the site via Warwick Place. Um, and that will be enforced by the applicant. So this is a view looking north into the site in the context of the police station. And then this is a view currently of the service yard, which isn't accessible um, by pedestrians. It's only used by the occupants. Um, and this area is uh, looking, this is the rear of McDonald's and the high street. So we've got some bins there, but there's probably, there's an opportunity to make improvements and that's covered in the section 106 legal agreement. So happy to take any questions and go back to any slides if members wish. Okay, no, thank you very much uh, for the pair of you for taking us through that presentation. Um, there was a couple of um, verbal addendums there in relation to a couple of conditions. But I think James, you probably want to cover those off. Uh, you I, I covered them off. But yes, I if I can just clarify, just what, clarify what, uh, what members, Zanab yeah. was doing, she was actually making three verbal amendments to conditions. So uh, it may be worthwhile uh, before there's a vote just running through those yeah, again. Yeah. Uh, is it okay if I say a few yeah, words? Yeah, I know you wanted to say a few words as well, James. So. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not going to do a long speech. Um, so this application has had a number of significant revisions made to address concerns raised during the initial consultation process. That's important to note. So where you see a number of objections under the consultation process, they related to the original plans, and there's actually been quite a lot of changes to this scheme to reduce its scale, its massing, uh, and quite a number of units were, were removed from the scheme. So I'm confident we're now at a point this is not just an acceptable scheme, but a good scheme. Um, but th there's one particular point I just wanted to, to uh, address uh, in case members had any particular questions. There is a comment on page 49 under health and social care, uh, uh, raising a, 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 the comment makes a concern about impact on council and NHS budgets. So just to address that point, this development's meeting a growing demand for specialised care for the elderly. It should be stressed that although the impact on social and healthcare budgets is not strictly speaking a material planning considerations, nonetheless meeting London Plan housing delivery targets definitely is. The newly adopted London Plan is a target figure for each borough for supported and specialised housing. It's actually 180 units per annum for this borough, so over a 10 year period that's quite a big uh, target to be, to be achieved. Uh, so although this council has its own programme of developments, uh, there will be a need for uh, private developments to come forward uh, if that chart target is to be achieved. Furthermore, there are various factors related to this particular development proposal which enable us to justify requesting a healthcare contribution. And on page 45 of the report, reference is given to the London Healthy Development Unit who are part of the NHS and they have a model which can be used to calculate healthcare section 106 contributions. Now it should be stressed that this model is designed to ensure higher contribution from developments where there are great anticipated NHS healthcare needs from the future occupiers. So this model has calculated a quite substantial sum of 900,229 pounds as a health contribution. And it should be noted that the, the, the applicant has agreed to pay this contribution in full uh, so it's one of the uh, planning obligations and the money would be used to used by the NHS locally to deliver healthcare benefits to offset impacts from the development proposals. Uh, so uh, what I'd say in conclusion is that this development is considered to comply fully with adopted development plan policies and is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chairman. No, thank you for that, James. Okay, uh, this is a petition item this evening uh, and it has a petition for, I believe. Um, but the petitioner is not here to, to present their petition. Um, the applicant is not nothing. nothing from the applicant, nothing from ward councillors either. So we are now at the point now where we can actually start to debate this as members. So Councillor Yarrow, did you indicate? Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, obviously, I've learnt a little bit tonight that are the questions I was going to ask, and you've cleared up some of them. I wasn't aware that uh, there was parking down on, on the exit road and I was saying you're short of parking spaces. Well, I now accept that the numbers do uh, tally up. Um, delivery and servicing, I had a, a, an idea here saying I really think that uh, uh, 
2200 hours to 06, meaning they're going to start delivering at 6 o'clock in the morning. I really think that we should be doing it at 8 a.m. in the morning, but I accept the fact that you've said Saturday and Sundays, no delivery, but I would like us to look at... Um, I mean, I'm an old person. I certainly don't want to be woken up at 6 o'clock in the morning if it's, if, if it's noisy, but, uh, you know, that, that's up for, up for debate. I would like to talk about refuse collection. If we look at... Uh, page 59 in the, uh, in the notes, and also page 308 in the um, outline, in the briefing documents, looking at where these refuse points are. Can you put the slide up for? Um, you know, I've got them. I, I, okay. I've marked them. What I want okay. to do is comment on them. Nobody else can right. see them if they aren't looking at... Uh, I, I will pull up the slide for you. So. Maybe if you can just indicate with your yes. pointer so, yeah. uh, so all members so can see what you're referring to. Four, so let me just explain how this will work. So there are four um, smaller ones. So we've got the refuse store here. Um, we have a refuse store here. We have a refuse store... In the triangle. In the triangle here. Yeah. And we have um, a refuse store here. So there's one for each core, and these will be emptied by the management uh, company um, looking after the site into a larger refuse store directly outside the collection point. In terms of how it will be managed, um, the applicant is proposing to use a private company that will um, empty the bins, the larger bins, twice a week and collect them twice a week. So it's not going to be one that's managed by the borough. No, and I didn't think it would be one that was managed by the borough. If you put your little dot, little pointer on the triangular one, that one there, yeah. The way out of there, the way out of that, ref, ref, where the residents put their refuse is to go down through the, through the rubber doors, or the doors, wherever it is, and out onto Harefield Road, and then walk all the way around back to the, to the the main dump. What I want to make sure is, is that nobody wants to take the easy way out and walk into Harefield Road and leave the rubbish on Harefield Road and not go all the way back to the dump because they would be expecting a lorry to come round to pick it up and drive down there so you could leave it at the end of the road and I want to make sure that we don't allow that. So that we need a little note in, in, in the documentation that it must all be placed in the, the, in the main refuse bin. Um, I, I, we can add, um, I think this is requ we're requiring servicing and delivery um, details anyway by condition, so we can make sure this is covered within uh, that condition. Um, but just to provide the members with some assurance, that within this area particularly, um, this is going to be managed, yeah, it's, it's this is going to be managed 24-7 because this is largely the care element um, in, within this block and this core. So it's unlikely that the residents living within this block, who will be paying the higher charges as well, will be putting the bins down themselves. It will be managed by um, a member of staff yeah, and the company. So I think... I think I'm assured that it won't come out onto Herfield Road to be collected, but we can cover that in the servicing and delivery condition. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll come back on that. But that Mandy, did you want to come? Can I just add a, a little rider? That's raised an, another question in my mind. What are we going to do with medical waste? Does that go in the same bins, or is it, is it a separate place for that? There's a sep it's, it's covered privately, so it's in the... It will be... Um, there's spaces and on the up on the um, first floor on the general arrangement plan because we're giving you limited packs now I don't have all of the plans um, in detail for you um, but there is space for that sluice uh, to be collected and they have actually created dedicated space where the care sort of the, the higher care need is being provided to manage that and collect it there and they will then you know, be moved to this uh, point. Uh, where, where's the pointer? They'll be moved to this point, which is a larger refuse store, and collected twice a week. So I think 
I'm assured that that will be managed. But we, we have a, it's actually um, a planning obligation because we know servicing and delivery is so important. We want the applicant to commit to it. And the applicant has agreed to the planning obligation, which is planning obligation 11, delivery and servicing for both the commercial and C2 use to include smaller domestic deliveries. And that will also include uh, the servicing for uh, waste. One last question, because I'm sure that uh Janet, you've got some questions you want to, <laughs> you, you want to ask. Um, it's going to be one way to get into the site, but when people leave, they're going to end down Warwick Place. It's, it's going to be a two-way road. I hope we're going to put the right signage up, otherwise it'll be going straight down and out into the, the wrong way, if you're not careful. Yes, I, 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 yes, the signage will be erected by the applicant uh, to make sure it's covered that it's a one-way road and th there'll be no, no entry signage so that people do not come in through this uh, entry point into the site. Um, just to note that all of this is, sorry, uh, that's, that's the plan. So this, this is Warwick Place, so this is the one-way system and yes, there will be signage here to prevent that. Sorry. I was just on that point, I know Mandy's looking to, to get in for some comments, but Alan, maybe from a highways perspective, can you uh, lend any of your expertise to sort of reassure Councillor Yarrow's uh, concerns over the uh, access through White Place? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, we discussed with the applicants um, the working of uh, access to the site, and um, it is going to be one way. Um, there will, should, should uh, Warwick Place um, need to become uh, one way itself, that would require a traffic order. But the way it would be managed is, I think that the developers are very keen to have a very um, prox, what's the word, uh, prominent entrance um, on the new access road where Halfords and Wicks currently enter. Um, so I think it will read very much that you'll be drawn to enter the site there. And as uh, Zinab said, should you mistakenly go up uh, Warwick Place, you would uh, encounter no entry signs and there would be room to uh, turn around. Okay, um, thank you for that. Alan, Councillor Yarrow? Yeah, no, I was just thinking more of, I, I, don't, I, I never thought there'd be any problem in coming in to the, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the building. It's when they drive up, drop off whoever it is they're dropping off and go back down again and enter Warwick Place. That they've, just end, they've just come in one way, but Warwick Place is two way. Now, if we're going to make it one way, I wouldn't have any objections to that, but one assumes the police, although it's not a police station at the moment, the police are there, uh, are they aware that it, suddenly they may not be able to get in that way? Um, I don't think there's any intention of making Warwick Place a one way street. So the signage for no entry will be placed at the development point as opposed to um, the entrance of Warwick. So Warwick uh, Road will continue as a two-way road. Um, the one-way system is just around the applicant site, within the applicant site. So, sorry, that's here. So, um, and Warwick Place will continue to be two-way and the one-way system will run along the applicant's road. Okay, thank you. I've got uh, Councillor Cawthorn's indicated, followed by Councillor Duncan, but I know, Mandy, you wanted to come in at one point there, did you, or has that been covered off now? I was going to suggest that the estate management plan condition is included, includes the details of refuse collection to cover off Councillor Yarrow's queries, which is condition number 29. I've added it to my list, so I'll go through all of them at the end. Yeah, there's been a few changes that we just need to cover off before we get to... Uh, to approving this or not, as the case may be. Um, Councillor Cawthorn. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think James has uh, he's either anticipated my uh, question or, or he's been tipped off along the way. But uh, I, mean, I, I, I do appreciate the comment in terms of adult social care. I did struggle with this, frankly, because the report is being presented to us uh, in a way that asks us to consider the benefit of the older people's accommodations and material planning consideration here. But meanwhile, we've got social care services telling us on page 79 that there are adverse impacts on social care budgets as a result of the business model. So 
you know, I, I understand what's being said about um, adult social care comments not being a material planning consideration, if I've understood James correctly, but uh, that, that's regrettable in my view. Um, my general view about the application is it's one that I'm sympathetic to and I'm minded to support. I'll listen to the debate, obviously. However, I do so reluctantly as I know the inherent benefits that are being claimed uh, for the local health and social care economy in this report are not recognised by health and social care partners locally who already have a very keen sense of what is required. I do at least recognise that the scheme has been improved significantly and I commend the applicant to the extent that they have worked to get the community on board, but I think those comments need to be made and they need to be heard by members before we make a decision. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Anything you want to come back with on, on that, James? Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to, going to make the point that it, it was that particular concern was a sort of interlinked uh, health and social care stroke NHS concern, but then we had a negotiation with the applicant uh, and we've got a substantial contribution of £900,000 that would go towards the NHS. So um, it would be miss of me to not to stress that particular point. Uh, uh, um, so, yeah, I, 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 I kind of, I thought this may come up as an issue, so I effectively, uh, there's not much more I can say uh, beyond the, the kind of small sort of presentation I did at, 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 at after um, the officer's presentation, but uh, yes, I, I think the point I would do is I'd stress that, that there is a London plan target that this will contribute to, uh, and there is a substantial health contribution. I think those two factors go a long way to outweigh the concern in effect. Thank you, James. Uh, Councillor Crawford, did you briefly, want a, a supplementary? I, I, shall, I shall leave it. I, I suspect local health partners will say, say something different if they were here. It's not a material consideration. I shall leave the matter there. Thank you. Okay. The, the, the point, I think, is, is noted in the minutes. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Um, one question. Um, well, several, actually. But starting with the podium area, um, it's a raised level. And normally, when we have these kind of areas at the top of buildings or halfway up buildings, we have a setback, we have quite a substantial setback, so that uh, things can't be thrown over the boundaries or, you know, uh, in high winds, plastic chairs can't blow over and hit somebody on the head below. And I know there have been um, occasions before we started conditioning this where that kind of thing happened. The plans, which are what we approve, don't show a setback. And uh, certainly in the um, CGIs we saw, you know, the illustrations, you know, which looks very pleasant, and I agree it's nice to have something at that level. Um, it looks as if uh, there isn't that um, security, if you like. If I can um, ask about that. Presumably that could be covered by uh, further conditions. Um, if I can ask about that. Um, also, uh, I noticed that we've got condition 15, which is about overheating and cooling. And it's about a scheme to reduce and minimise impacts to residents in more extreme heat events. This isn't quite the condition that I would suggest that we need. Part of the London plan, which we now have to implement, says that the network heating in buildings should be such that we have, at the design stage, some approval to that. And this is because we've had, which we know locally, all kinds of issues, um, but one certainly in my own ward, which caused a lot of concern, where we had um, pipes relating to the heating system running down the main central corridors of blocks of flats. So when we were all sweltering in 40 degree heat last year, there were people literally had to be moved out, older people, for their own safety by their relatives. So this doesn't actually quite cover that because this is, we need something that talks about the design. We're not talking about events. We're talking about the, the this being integrated into the design of the building from the word go. And I think, I forget what it was, it was something like um, 
policy 20 or something in the local, in the London plan. It's been carried forward to the newly adopted version, but I know that Mandip and, and James did do work on this and have spoken about it before at committee. So if I could ask if that could be looked at, please, and um, either a new condition or some amendments that put in. Um, the other thing as well is about the low carbon technology. Um, we are becoming aware that in certain cases where PV panels are being put in, that the building itself is not benefiting from that. Management companies can sell that energy back to the grid and it's not used um, to make a sustainable building, if you like. Um, and I know that's something that's part of management and obviously management needs to maintain these so that you've got um, green energy. Um, but we would like to, if that can be incorporated into a condition, so that where a building has got PV panels, that building benefits from that. Um, obviously subject to the maintenance costs, which will be part of the management. Um, and at the moment, I don't think it quite does that. Um, if that could be looked at, please. Um, the other thing was on page uh, 70, um, in large type 40 on our blue sheet, um, the Environment Agency says, since the site is situated on a principal aquifer, these proposals need to be dealt with in a way which protects the underlying groundwater. I haven't seen anything in conditions or informatives about that, but... I'm hoping that that has been safeguarded in some way. Um, in fact, just flag that up. Thank you. And then the last thing, which, which is something which I'm always talking about, which is air quality. And I notice that this is in a focus area. It's in the already congested Uxbridge focus area. In addition, the proposed development will include a diesel fuel oil emergency generator. When already the government has said, you know, it's already made, um, well, proposals and, and uh, future commitments. Um, and I, I see that there's going to be some um, mitigation to this. Uh, but I wondered if there was anything that could be done other than putting in diesel. I mean, it just seemed, uh, you know, uh, well, very retro technology in a way. And um, it requires a continued um, improvement of air quality. Well, this doesn't improve air quality. And what makes this ironic is this is a place for older people who need care. They don't need gassing with pollution. And this is... Already we've had this case where air pollution was considered a contributory factor to the death of a nine-year-old girl on the South Circular Road. I believe that was part of the coroner's verdict at that time. And I realise that a lot of work needs to be done. But we must do something about this. This is why I continually am unable, just on grounds of conscience, not to vote for developments that put residential into areas of such bad air pollution because we know that people will suffer from this and we should as planning planning the word it says planning we should be planning not for this to happen so i appreciate all the advantages i I'm, i can see that it's a much better scheme than that previously proposed it is something that we need there are people living longer they do need care Facilities like this, yes, are very much needed and appreciated, I'm sure, by the people living in them and their families, where they're secure, well cared for, etc. But I just, I'm afraid, will not be able to vote for this, although I would like to, simply because it's in this Uxbridge focus area of poor air quality. So, thank you. It might... I mean, I'll come to, I'll, I'll, I've got a response for all of the points raised, so I'll come to your first and the most vocal point, which is about air quality. So um, you've picked up on the diesel generator quite rightly, and this was extensively, we had a separate workshop or two with the applicant 
to address air quality matters. So if I can just, and I attended all of these meetings, so I can assure you this is, this is the conversation. Um, they were asked to explore alternatives for that generator and they had gone away and explored them. The only reason this is being provided is uh, for emergency life support should anything fail and someone is on life support. That is the only event in which it would be used. It would not be used on a daily basis, on a regular basis. Hopefully, um, the electricity and gas and so on and whatever else is required will be working across the area. But in the event something fails, and I believe that's the same case for hospitals and so on, um, it's an emergency backup generator just for these um, extreme events and it won't be used otherwise. So that's the answer to that one, yeah. Uh, just to this building itself, the Civic Centre has a backup generator that comes in when there is electricity failures in, in, in Uxbridge. So, uh, yeah, I, I, um, if I can come back on some of the conditions, because I think I can go some way to address your c concerns. So, the Environment Agency, it, their comments, uh, they're effectively basically saying there needs to be a robust contaminated land condition. Uh, and condition 18 uh, is a very lengthy and detailed condition. So I, 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 I think that condition uh, would address the concern from the Environment Agency because it, it does require a comprehensive contaminated land report. If I may slightly paraphrase uh, your comments with respect to conditions 14 and 15. So condition 15, uh, I think the point you, you're making is, is the condition robust enough in it with regard to the London plan policy on overheating? So uh, I think the question is there, there really to offer us is can we strengthen this condition? Uh, uh, and uh, if you are happy to sort of either delegate to me or chairman and labor lead, we can certainly go, go away quickly after the meeting, have a sort of further look at the condition. Uh, we do have our own, uh, uh, Ian Thines, our sort of expert on energy matters. This is a quite new condition, so uh, when we've had new conditions, they have evolved in effect. So we, we could certainly look at strengthening that, but with condition 14, uh, and I'm gonna, apologies if I'm paraphrasing again, I fear that you're asking for something that goes beyond current London plan policy. Now, what I would say, if I'm going to give any positive, it, is that the, a lot of these London plan policies, the new London plan, is going to be supplementary planning documents to follow, and it may be the case that they then address that concern, and as soon as the mayor publishes such documents, we can then strengthen our conditions. But I think at, at, at the moment, um, I know the point that you're making because I'm, I'm aware of a separate member's inquiry that uh, the timing is un unfortunate because it was only a few days ago. You, you haven't yet had a response. But I don't, as of today, uh, if you were to delegate to me to strengthen the, the condition, I don't know I'd be able to. Whereas with condition 15, uh, I'd be slightly more confident that we might be able to look at strengthening the, the wording, but I can't, yeah, I'm struggling with condition 14, I'm afraid. Um, I, I might be able to help. So on, on the overheating condition, um, you'll recall that the previous reason for refusal included overheating and the applicant has gone away, provided further information, further analysis, further work on the design and so on to um, mitigate against overheating and this has been scrutinized carefully by Ian he did not let them off easily um, and this is actually a s condition that he has proposed after looking at this very carefully you know we had that reason for refusal he's in, in to address that reason for refusal we've received more information and Ian has actually proposed this as a bespoke condition rather than one of the standard overheating conditions we usually have on major reports on the point about um, the use of energy for the development itself, the energy strategy provided by the applicant proposes exactly that. So, um, you know, with the general compliance document, uh, sorry, the condition requiring compliance with what they have proposed, 
um, you know, there is a mechanism to hold them to account if they decide to do something otherwise. But the intention is to provide energy that will serve this building itself from the PV panels. Sorry, if I can just add to, um, if the developers produced a report with good practice in it, there's no reason why we can't put that good practice in the condition. So I would stand by my comment that if you're happy to delegate to me, uh, uh, I'm sure we could look at strengthening the wording of condition 15. Yes, if I can come back through you, Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you for um, all those comments, yes, much appreciated. Um, yes, certainly I'm happy to delegate that. I wouldn't have thought that uh, in terms of the uh, PV panels or whatever form of green energy is being being proposed in a building, the fact that you're conditioning it to that building, I don't see any problem in that. It's like saying the car parking for a building shop, you know, will not be uh, let off to some other, it, it, you know, commercial uh, operator. In other words, it's saying don't commercialise this, use it for the building, don't make it a separate um, issue. That, that's what it's doing, that's what I'm asking for. And I think that's the whole tenor of conditions anyway, which relate to development. They are for that development. It's not, you know, proving anything else. So I wouldn't have thought that there would have been um, an issue about that if, if that was done. But I appreciate that, um, you know, the London plan, it's so much better if you've got a specific policy about that and hopefully there will be guidance that will be forthcoming, that will strengthen that position. Um, on the overheating, yes, please, if you can look at that again, because it, it does talk about more extreme heat events, as if this is something that you, um, you cater for from time to time, whereas in fact, it's something that you need to build in. It's an integrated part of the design, you know, when you're um, designing the building and the system that it has. And I think that was in the advice notes in the London plan about that too. And that's really why I mention it, because now is the time to do it. You know, it's not later on. So, um, yes, I have every confidence you'll be able to do that, James, because I know that you've, we've, we've talked about this at other meetings. I'm sure we're fed up with hearing about it, but it is, it is an important issue. So thank you for that. Can we also um, pick up the point on setbacks that was raised um, by Councillor Duncan? Do uh, Mandy, do you want to pick that up? I was going to propose that we added it to condition number seven, which is already trying to look at the details of the podium itself. So it's looking at details of the microclimate, the finished floor levels, um, adjoining the podium garden, and a third point could be added for... Um, set adequate setbacks where it's necessary because there's only two points, one that faces onto the public plaza and one adjoining the residential properties. Okay, right. Uh, good debate, that. And I'm sure there's uh, a couple more councillors that want to want to contribute. So I've got Councillor Higgins who's indicated. Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, it tickles me to think that over 65s will start throwing things off the pony that uh, they have leather jackets and have Harley Davidson's, but we, we, we'll move on. Um, two, two things. Um, I pick up something that um, uh, Councillor Duncan said about the, the generator. I'm sure it's going to be state of the art. And most diesel engines now actually push out cleaner air than, than, than things. So I would hope that would be the case. Um, obviously, the trees you'll do to make sure they mitigate things as you usually do. So that's fantastic. Is the additional 900k, is it additional or is it in the 3 million? That's what I want to know. It's additional. And also, um, you've got a very good shattering re report. I don't. I was a bit concerned about shattering, but if officers think it's fine, I'll, I'll go with that. How many electrical charging points will be on the uh, on those uh, parking spaces? Because let's be honest, a lot more of those vehicles, the, the type the type of clientele that are going to be buying this, will probably have electrical vehicles rather than petrol ones. So that will help. And that may be a uh, thing. And uh, I think that's about it. Oh, yeah, visitor parking. That Obviously, that's, man that's monitored by this, the management team on site. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. You can answer some of those. Do you want to pick any of those up? Yeah, if I can just clarify the daylight, su su uh, daylight sunlight issue. So uh, 
and this is an issue that uh, we've kind of commented on before. Uh, when you have buildings over a certain height, you inevitably end up with a certain number of technical BRE fails because once it goes up to seven stories, there's uh, the lower floor flats that the reality is you end up with areas that in, in shade for parts of the day. So the question then becomes is, is the number of fails unacceptable or not? And what we're basically saying as officers uh, and the consultants are saying is that the small number of fails is kind of what you'd expect for development of this scale and, the, and, and as such, it is, is acceptable from a daylight, sunlight perspective and, and the impacts on neighbouring properties, they are okay. It's the fails are to do with intern, internal within the development because you've got buildings that go up to seven storeys. But it's kind of why do you recognise that, that you just have to accept that there, there is a sort of limited number of fails of schemes of, of this sort? Um, um, I'm afraid that's kind of what it is. <laughs> um, I might be help, able to help you a bit further because I, I was anticipating this so I did some proper research. So <laughs> in terms, there's, there's a thing called average daylight factor which uh, is the amount of light a room will receive and that has come back 100% residents in the future development will receive all of those lights. And um, there's another point which is like annual probable sunlight hours and that is the amount of light hitting windows across the entire year. And a couple of windows that serve bedrooms and in parts of the site um, don't meet the full requirement, but they still achieve very good levels. So taking that into context and the fact that the other windows within the same flat will receive good levels of light, and I check every single one of these on each floor, um, just in case you weren't happy. Uh, I can assure you that I'm, I'm satisfied that this is a um, good quality living environment and they will receive adequate light. Um, on the uh, car parking, we have a condition that's condition six. And so we have 46 car parking spaces. Five of those will be served by active, that's 20%. And the 41 spaces will be served by passive. EVCP, yeah. Right, through you, Chairman. Thank the, you. The 900K. I'll be, and before I let you answer that, uh, love the typeface on this. A lot easier to read. I don't know. But anyway, but that's another matter. So, two, yes. Um, in terms of the typeface, because of the length of the report, we had to do it in a Word document. So, unfortunately, that um, um, it, it was one of just one of those things, unfortunately. Um, it, the, the, the obligations, it is a separate contribution. So there's the affordable housing, uh, which is um, approximately three million, uh, and then there is 900,000 health on top of that. Um, uh, just, sorry, one final point. Uh, I know Councillor Duncan's concerned about air quality, but there's a lot of features of this development. So just to cite page 312, you've got a biodiverse wildflower roof that there is a quite a lot of measures in this this development, and it and it uh, um, in terms of that would go a long way to address air quality. And as I think as an ad mentioned in her presentation, the landscaping plans already include uh, entirely pollution absorbing species. So um, it, the development is going as far as it can in terms of addressing air quality. Is where I'm going with this. Thank you, through you, Chairman. I'd like to move this recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Higgins. I think uh, before we get to um, what we're voting on, there were quite a few verbal um, amendments to conditions and there was quite some debate around conditions that either need to be strengthened or... So we just need to summarise all of those for members and then we're moved and then we'll, we'll move on and see how we go. So, Mandy, are you OK to summarise that for us? So to summarise, condition number four will be amended to include reference to the C2 use class Condition 24 will be amended to prevent deliveries on Sundays and bank holidays unless members just want to start deliveries at 8 a.m. I think that's still a question. I'm looking at the room to see if uh, I'm not getting any sort of nods. But well, I mean, I, I would like you to start at 8 a.m. Okay. My own personal view. Are we, are we happy for that? Um, Because it's a town centre location, I 
be edging members towards s seven a a a a.m. But I'll, it's up to members. I'll, I'll split I'll the difference. We'll there's, there's a few nods from members, so I think we'll go with seven, Mandy. You, you can carry on for us. So condition 24 is amended to have deliveries and servicing shall not take place between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Monday to Saturday and until 7 a.m. on Sundays and bank holidays. It would be no delivery and servicing between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. Mondays to Saturdays and no deliveries and servicing on Sundays and bank holidays. Okay, got that. Fantastic. Condition 33 is a new condition that we're proposing to add for automated lighting to be switched off in communal spaces, and that's commercial and communal spaces. So that's a new condition. We will amend condition 29, the estate management plan, to include reference to refuse collection and specifically preventing refuse and waste being left on Harefield Road. We will look to review condition 15, which is overheating alongside Ian Thine, to ensure that it makes specific reference to design changes to the building to be incorporated uh, to prevent the extreme weather, uh, extreme events, apologies. And within condition seven, we will include a third bullet point making reference to setbacks for the podium decks. Okay. And I think out, out of all of that, we're delegating authority to uh, Deputy Director to amend condition 15. Yeah. Okay, that was quite a list, but we've got to pull this all together now. Uh, Councillor Higgins, are you still happy to move it with those amendments? I'm still happy to move it. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Arrow? Aye. You're happy to second. Okay. We are moved. We are seconded. I'm not seeing any other members indicating to speak. So can I have votes on the, on the movement by Councillor Higgins to approve this application? All those in favour? That's four. Councillor Duncan, are you abstaining? Okay. Okay. We got there in the end. So I can confirm that item number seven of the land off of Hereford Road this evening is approved. Thank you very much, everybody, for some very robust debate. Okay, draw some breath, and we can now move on to agenda item uh, eight this evening, which is our second petition item. Um, we do have a petitioner in the room uh, this evening, Ariona Billow. Good evening, welcome. Welcome to the major planning application. Um, okay, you'll get an opportunity to address the committee once they've heard the, uh, the presentation. Correct, so um, who's taking us on this one? Okay, Zanib, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, item 8 relates to Tower Stock Works. Um, so I'm just going to take you through the location plan and the site constraints plan. So the area is covered by a parking management scheme. Um, it is to the rear of the High Street. Um, it usually High Street. Um, we have the Padcroft development to the north and northeast of the site. And to the west, there is a consent in place. So Padcroft has been developed. There was a consent for 315 units. And to the west, there is a consent in place for 104 units. Um, and then, so this application forms part of policy SA38, uh, which is a comprehensive uh, development for the whole site. And this is the final sort of piece of the jigsaw. Um, so this is the existing site plan. It comprises a two-storey building, which is currently in use as an office, but has prior approval consent to be used as residential. Um, and these are the existing elevations. As you can see the context, the emerging context. Um, at the moment, the site to the west hasn't been built, but there is a consent in place. Uh, existing elevation west and the ground floor plan. So this is a proposed ground floor plan. So you have two residential units with their own access. So this is the only access into this unit. There's no sec other access. And uh, likewise, the access um, to the second residential unit. You then have the residential entrance, cycle storage, two-way uh, car parking entrance, which leads to this area of car parking. 
It includes a disabled car parking space and four car parking stackers for um, eight vehicle parking spaces. And then the refuse store is located to the very end of the building at ground floor level. So it can't be accessed from the inside. So if you want to dispose of your waste, you'll have to walk along, come down the building, walk along the road, and then it, it, access it externally. So um, this is a first floor plan, and the applicant is proposing an intensive green roof on this um, elevation that's north facing, and it is surrounded by built form. Um, it also, the applicant suggests it's going to be communal amenity space, although officers disagree with that. This is the second floor plan, third floor plan, fourth, fifth, so it goes up the building. And then at sixth floor level, there's a further area that the applicant considers communal amenity space, um, but it's also used as an intensive green roof. And members can see uh, that there is a bit of a walkway and then, but no further details have been provided of what this intensive roof, green roof will be, will entail and how it will be built up. Uh, likewise, on the seventh floor plan, we have another further area of what the applicant refers to as communal amenity space that is intended to be used both as a green roof and amenity. Right. And the roof plan, uh, there's no PV panels here. Um, and it's very limited space, so there's a further green roof. This is a north elevation. These windows will back onto Fitzroy Court. Uh, they serve corridors. This is the east elevation facing Yardley Court. The south elevation, which is along Tavistock Road, You'll note that it includes winter gardens, and the reason for the inclusion of winter gardens is to uh, prevent the noise from uh, the commercial activity further to the south. Um, and the proposed west elevation is a site section, and you'll see that there's a slight dip where the applicant is proposing um, the car parking stackers, but there is no basement this time round. Uh, so, uh, this application, there was a previous application in, in 2020, which was refused by this committee, um, and this is a revised proposal that the applicant has submitted to overcome the reasons for refusal. So, um, Policy SA 38 notes that the Council will support proposals for development on Site C, which is the application site, in accordance with the London Plan Density Guidelines and subject to the agreement of design principles. Proposals should integrate with and complement development on adjacent sites. It does, not it does not set out any specific height parameters or specify a quantum of units that should be provided by the site. It establishes the quantum of development is to be determined by design. So planning permission is sought for redevelopment of the site, so including the demolition of the existing two-story building and the erection of a part six, part seven, part eight story building to provide 32 residential units with cycle parking, car parking, and associated amenity space. There's no objection to redevelopment of the site for the residential development, but the overall scale, siting, proximity to the adjacent completed development, particularly that to the north, which is Fitzroy Court, is, um, is considered to result in a cramped and overbearing visual relationship with the neighbouring site. The layout of some of the units, particularly those at ground floor level, uh, with limited windows and particularly these which are high level windows, uh, is of concern, as it doesn't particularly lend itself to a high quality living environment. and. Um, also, as you go up the building, you will have noticed there's some very tight angles around some of the rooms. Um, and it will detrimentally harm neighbouring amenity. So a previous application for 34 units was considered to result in a significant loss of amenity to op occupants of the flat in the adjoining Padfoff development. So removal of just two units in this scheme to provide 32 units does not overcome the amenity issues um, that resulted in the previous scheme being refused. 
So it is acknowledged that the site is allocated for comprehensive development. However, the con quantum, it does state the quantum is to de be determined by the site. So the current proposal would encompass the entirety of the site and it would result in an unacceptable degree of harm to neighboring residents. In coming to a recommendation, officers have considered all of the benefits uh, that the applicant has stated and we have given weight to this uh, proposed comprehensive development but however officers consider the benefits do not outweigh the harm and therefore our recommendation is for refusal but I'll just take you through the rest of the slides so this is the refuse scheme and this is the amended scheme so you'll see that the biggest change is here it's the east um, is a bird's eye view of the current site and this is approaching the site looking west and this is looking north along the site um, it's these windows in particular that will be impacted by the development and this is the site context it's a uh, a view of the site in the context of the Padcroft development. So I think that's the last of my slides. Um, I'm happy. So the recommendation, officer recommendation is for refusal for reasons stated in the report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Okay, no, thank you for taking us through that. So um, let me now, um, thank you for that presentation. We're now over to our lead petitioner for this item, uh, Ariana Billo. So thank you for being very patient with us this evening oh, that's um, fine. with all the other applications we've had. Now, I need to explain a couple of things to you. So first and foremost, thank you for attending and addressing the committee this evening. Thank you. Um, you have five minutes to address the committee. Uh, in front of me, there's a traffic light system. So green, you're good. That's your four minutes. Four minutes, it goes to amber. And then when it gets to five minutes, it goes red. And at that point, I will have to stop you if you haven't already finished. Yeah. Um, I understand that you've got a video to, yep. to show members of the committee. Um, if you want to talk to that video, because I know the video yep. is roughly two minutes in length, um, but if you don't talk through that video, then obviously that limits your speaking to three minutes. So it's the overall is, is five minutes, so you might want to talk members through through the video. So um, when you're ready, you've obviously yep. worked yeah, out the, the button as well. Yep. So I'll, um, <coughs> I'll leave it over to you now. So your five minutes starts now. Yeah, so I'm here to represent the residents of Fitzroy Court um, and we collectively set out our formal objections um, and uh, grievances against the proposed plans submitted by Linea Homes for the redevelopment of the Tavistock Works site. Um, the first point I would like to make is about density. So the current proposal um, at 457 units per hectare far ex exceeds the applicable density guidelines. The proposed eight-story wall is planned to be erected right in front of the residence bedroom windows and balconies, completely blocking our access to natural sunlight and daylight. The resulting impact of this is an extreme overdeveloped and overbearing design, which will strip the residents of its natural and illumination natural light and illumination, impacting our physical and mental well-being. The second point is about loss of privacy. Policy 5.38 requires a minimum of 21 meters distance between windows of habitable rooms. In addition, the London, the London Borough of Hillington residential layouts design guidance advises a minimum distance of 15 meters between the main windows of habitable rooms and a flank wall of any new development. As currently submitted, the Tavistock Works proposal contravenes both the aforementioned policies. According to the plans, the wall of the, of the proposed building would stand only five meters away from the master bedroom windows in Fitzroy Court. In addition, the proposed balcony and habitable room windows would be located only 15 meters away from the living rooms of the residents of Yardley Court. Thirdly, the proposal outlines an open roof garden for future occupants located only 1.5 meters away from the existing Fitzroy Court balcony on the, on the sixth floor, which is completely unacceptable. 
Should this planning application be approved and build proceed, the residents will be left with an objectively unreasonable level of overlooking between our habitable rooms and the building erected. This will result in a loss of privacy, an increased sense of enclosure, a complete loss of outlook, as well as gloomy, dark bedrooms, which will severely impact our physical and mental health. The third point is about loss of light. We, um, should, we, should the proposed development proceed, many of the residents' bedrooms would not, me would not meet the BRE criteria, which is designed to guard the well-being of UK residents against unhuman proposals. As submitted, plans will mean that the residents will suffer an extreme loss of vertical um, vertical sky um, component in their bedrooms, up to 91.40%, loss of daylight as severe as 98.3%, and loss of no skyline of more than 80%. The residents have serious doubts and concerns to the objectivity and validity of the report provided into this issue. The mirror image assessment contained within the report seems to be out of context, and a sunlight impact analysis on block four of its record appears absent. This should be rectified and provided to the residents as at the earliest for them to consider. Uh, the next point is about outlook. Within Fitzroy Court, 14 bedrooms would suffer severe loss of outlook from their bedroom windows. The view from such bedrooms would be an eight-story blank wall within a distance of five to 10 meters. This will be both overbearing and overdeveloped in terms of bulk, shape, and height, and would severely impact the residents and the children's residents' mental health by removing natural light and illumination to the, pro to the properties. Um, objection raised previously. So the residents have raised the above objections, both formally and informally, on several occasions. To date, not one of such objections has been addressed by Linea Homes. It appears to the residents that the proposed development is entirely financially motivated, failing to take into account the, the impact on both the area as a wall and the impact on lives of the individual residents who proceeded at Fitzroy Court. The I'm going to have to draw you to yeah, an end that's now. Fine. Sorry about that. But, yeah, uh, I was nearly to the end, so okay. I'm sure good. I have said a lot. T time nearly beat you, but I think yeah. you, got, you got your point over. Um, before I open up to members who might have a couple of questions for you, I think, James, you wanted to come in on something? It, it, it's just that, um, unfortunately, I always have to give a sort of health warning when we have these kind of technical m m models that we as officers can't 100% verify all the the dimensions uh, and what is being shown to you. That said, the petitioner referred to a, this is a severe impact and your officers 100% agree that this would have a severe impact uh, on the amenity of occupiers of Fitzroy Court. So I just wanted to say that, that point. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, no, thank you, James. Okay, do members have any questions for our lead petitioner for this application? Do you want to come in? Yes, yeah, sorry. If I can just come in on one point. I forgot to mention the addendum. Um, there's clarification in the addendum. The design officer um, has just clarified that their comments may have been misinterpreted or could be misinterpreted. They're not actually saying that the townscape is acceptable. Uh, if you read the comments in full, it will explain that there are issues, you know, significant design issues with this scheme and uh, their particular concern uh, over the relationship between the proposed building and the Fitzroy Court building. Okay, no, thank you for clarifying that. So, again, any members got questions for our lead petitioner this evening? No? Okay, and again, on behalf of the committee, thank you for addressing us this evening. Okay, uh, in the interest of balance and fairness, we also have an opportunity for the applicant to state their case. I believe there's a written statement come yes. through, so over to you, Steve. Okay, so this is from the agent for this application. Dear members, thank you for the opportunity to allow this statement to be read to you. I am Mark Westcott, the director at HGH Consulting and the planning agent. My client, the applicant, is Linear Homes. 
The application before you follows an application on the Tavistock site, which was refused in October 2020. This planning application builds upon the accepted design principles and merits established by the previous scheme and responds positively to the reasons for refusal. Please note the reduction in the reasons for refusal. The technical assessments submitted as part of this application establish that the proposed development meets all required technical guidance, as well as national and London planning policy objectives. Where appropriate, mitigation measures and financial contributions have been set out. The proposed scheme would deliver several public benefits, including completion of the final part of a des designated site for comprehensive redevelopment, the regeneration and effective use of an underutilized brownfield site, new housing in a location that is very accessible to shops and services in Usley Town Centre, to West Drayton Rail Station, Railway Station, and the expanse of open space at the regional park less than 500 metres away. Contributing towards the vitality and viability of Usley Town Centre, delivery of 32 high quality, good sized new homes, which will help to meet local housing need, noting Hilling Hillingdon's housing annual target nearly doubling as a result of the adopted new London plan. Provision of family sized accommodation, provision of excellent living conditions through demonstrable good daylight levels, good noise environment, and access to private and communal amenity space a high quality and sustainably designed building, biodiversity enhancement and urban greening, restoring historic industrial land, encouragement of sustainable travel through low car parking provision, provision of car, car club space and measures through the framework travel plan and financial contributions towards employment and training, nearby public open space, air quality mitigation and carbon offsetting as well as towards community infrastructure. Beyond the delivery of many public benefits, as stated previously, the proposal would, compl would complete the comprehensive development of site allocation SA38. Officers are recommending refusal primarily on grounds of design and neighboring amenity impact. The applicant has actively sought to engage officers since early 2019 on design, although officers have offered little in the way of guidance or advice as to the design parameters within which to comprehensively develop the site. Whilst we accept that it's not for the council to design the scheme, it is the responsibility of the council to engage proactively and positively with the applicant. By not doing so, especially where policy SA38 seeks a design-led approach, is a dereliction of duty. The duty is amplified by the council's responsibility to deliver much needed housing on sites that the council has allocated. Turning to the impact on neighbor, neighboring amenity, which is, to, which is to reference to residents' privacy and overlooking of the site from Fitzroy Court. It should be noted that officers commissioned an independent daylight and sunlight assessment by Avison Young to review the technical evidence put forward by point two on behalf of the applicant. The independent review acknowledges the robust approach taken by point two. It also notes that BRE approved mirror assessment, i.e. the assessment of an equivalent building mass adjacent to the sub subject building, found that a worse impact would be caused. Hence, the proposal is a better proposition. On other related impacts, such as overbearing, a sense of enclosure and loss of outlook, officers offer little in the way of robust analysis to substantiate their assertion other than by reference to height, scale and mass effects. Again, officers have provided no guidance on how to overcome these alleged issues. This has left the applicant exasperated given the fact that the subject windows were not part of the original, of the original Fitzroy Court approval. Instead, officers allowed a minor amendment that approval for the reconfiguration of the flat layouts and installation of windows in that part of the building without due consideration of the policy requirement to comprehensively develop Tavistock Works, another example of dereliction of duty. The applicant has been left extremely disappointed Throughout the determination period of this app planning application, as well as before, we have regularly tried to proactively engage with officers to ensure that any comments received can be addressed through additional information or incorporated through design changes. Key comments have been withheld and only found out via tonight's committee report. In conclusion, and response to the recommendation for refusal, the applicant has sought legal advice and is in the process of appointing leading counsel to support a planning appeal inquiry if the application is refused this evening. If refused, the appeal will be supported by an application of costs on the council's failure to engage with the applicants proactively and positively. 
a requirement of paragraph 38 of the NPPF. The advice is that the applicant's case on appeal is very strong considering the revised design, positive technical assessment and the circumstances that have led to prohibiting the comprehensive redevelopment requirement set out in policy SA38. SA the applicant therefore requests that members give very careful consideration to the need for robust justification to the suggested reasons for refusal in preference to reversing, in preference to reversing the recommendation in favour of granting permission this evening. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that, Steve. And again, thank you to Mr. Mark Westcott for submitting that written statement. I think I also need to mention that had uh, the applicant been here in person, they would have been subject to the same traffic light system that you were, but because they got a written statement, they have a word limit, which they're well within. So that's just to, to clarify that for you. Okay, um, right, before we open it up to members to debate, now we've heard from the applicant and the petitioner. James, did you want to cover off a couple of points? Yeah, it's just one typographical error. Uh, reason three, uh, the uh, fourth line down, it should say adopted, not emerging with respect to Hill the Hillingdon Local Plan Part 2. Um, uh, 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 and then just a quick comment from me uh, with regard to the two speeches. Uh, your officers would basically completely concur with the words of, of the petitioner, uh, and I would completely disagree with pretty much everything that was said by, by, by the um, applicant's agent. Um, but uh, 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 I'll keep it short. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, so we're happy to get that um, typo amended, so we'll do that. Um, and just, Steve, anything from ward councillors? Nothing from ward Nothing councillors. from ward councillors. Okay, right. Councillor Higgins, you've got your hand up there, followed by Councillor Duncan. Yeah, this is, this is a no-brainer, really. I mean, it doesn't help when people come along and insult our planning officers. I won't have that. Anyway, um, no, the report stands up by itself. Um, I've, uh, I've been told on many occasions that CGI and all these things are not to be taken literally because they will never be the same anyway, But uh, so you don't have to worry about that, James. Um, the video, fine. Do. Um, yeah, I would just go with officers' recognition. I, I don't really have any. I mean, I, I could knock it about a bit, but it's, it's the report's quite solid as it is, so um, I will propose it as well. Okay, thank you, Councillor Higgins. Councillor Duncan, followed by Councillor Dot. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you to um, the resident who came to speak about this and present the video, which I think we do all understand that. Um, Yes, we have to, to view it um, in the context in which it's submitted. Really, we must look at the plans and the presentation. They are the matters that we must make our decision on, although that was very helpful to see that. Um, one of the things that um, uh, the planning officer told us was that the waste uh, collection area is at the end of the site on Tavistock Road, and I would just like to clarify, does that mean that if you're on the seventh floor and you've got rubbish to put out, that you've got to haul your black sack or recycling sacks down seven floors, walk along Tavistock Road, because this is the only facility for all these flats? Can that I is correct. So you would have to walk out, uh, I would imagine, so, yes, along the street with your rubbish, and then, uh, you know, use this, th this is the only door you can see yourself. Yes. Yeah. I did. Um, and there's space for, you know, the, the waste officer said there's space for enough bins, but yes, you do need to come out of your flat onto the street, through, along here, past the car parking spaces and the cycle spaces, to the bin store to dispose of your waste. For that, I think that, um, I mean, had we been minded to approve this, I think we would have wanted to have seen a different arrangement. And I don't know if the inconvenience of that um, can be included in the, uh, I know it's talking about the harmful impact on the residential amenities of neighbouring properties, but it doesn't exactly uh, propose a most uh, convenient um, arrangement for any potential occupiers of this building. So I don't know if that can be uh, 
included. I just suggest that for consideration. I um, know this site very well. It's uh, very close to my ward. It's not in my ward, but I do know the area well, and I've seen this development go up and sat on the committees that have approved the other developments. We've had site visits, and um, so I feel I do know it quite well. And I do agree with the officer's recommendations, and I do take on board the points made by the resident on behalf of other residents. And um, I have to agree with them, and I would therefore like to second this, um, if uh, we could just have a comment about that issue of the waste um, and it's, you know, the, the layout, is the layout a good layout? Thank, okay, you. thank you, Councillor Duncan. I suppose to, to, to paraphrase that, is, is there any way of adding a, a further refusal reason or including the point made into the existing refusal reasons? Um, let me just go back to that. So, it's, it's the inconvenience of having to. Yeah, there is, there is that inconvenience factor. I mean, one one would imagine that it could have been redesigned to um, have, you know, had internal access off this lobby into the waste store, and then that would have come out. And and the um, yeah, <laughs> Nicole, yeah. Um, sorry, if I might come in, Chairman. Yes, please do. Um, what I would say is that uh, refusal reason number two, it does actually mention layout, um, which may include the whole site in terms of layout. And it then goes on to say, unacceptably harmful impact on the residential amenities. I think that if we were at appeal, we could clearly argue that that was one of the issues. So I think it's covered. No, I think you. the re officer report also talks about the inconvenience factor. So, I, you know, I think it's an overall design issue. Um, yeah. Okay. No, thank you for that, uh, Nicole. Councillor Duncan, you okay with that? Well, no, I did refer to that, um, uh, Nicole, because it says, due to those reasons, it would have an unacceptably harmful impact on the residential amenities of the neighbouring properties not on Apologies. potential occupiers. And I was saying, yes, I think it does. I agree with that statement. Yeah. It would have a harmful impact could we, could on the residential amenity of neighbouring properties, but I think it could also, um, yes, uh, not have a very good effect on the amenities and living conditions of potential occupiers. And it was just if that could be included somewhere or consideration be given to that. I don't mind if it's delegated for, to chair and they the lead. Okay, well, I think, well, James has reached for his big book, so that's, a, that's, <laughs> a good, that's always a good sign. Um. I think we can, and the, I'll, I'll just say the reason we can, it, it, is that uh, with this 600-page New London plan, <laughs> there's, there's, there's almost some, something for everything. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I apologise that sounds slightly unprofessional, but uh, there is a lot of policies in here on good design and urban realm. So I, th I think if you're happy to delegate to me, I don't think we'd, we'd be adding an extra reason. We'd be looking at the... Uh, um, the uh, it wouldn't be reason... I agree with, you, agree with you. I don't think it's reason two, because that's to do with the neighbouring amenity. But we can look at the other reasons, and, and I think... We, we, the policies are there in the new London plan that we can then um, argue the case at appeal. Thank you. I, I would hope that we could do that because otherwise I think um, we're just saying that this kind of arrangement would be, uh, you know, acceptable in any other development or future development. So if there are to be a redrafting of proposals for this site, which perhaps there may be at some future point, that's something that the... Um, applicant, the developer could take on board at the design stage. Thank you. So I think the output from that debate is uh, James will thumb his way through 600 pages and come up with something which both uh, myself as chair and yourself as Labour lead will sign off on behalf of the committee. You okay with that? Yeah, just to clarify, I'm, um, as officers, we cross-reference a lot of these design policies and I, I, I know there is something there. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, it would take me too long to, to, to find it in the next couple of minutes. <laughs> a, few, a few long nights ahead, I think, for uh, Deputy uh, Director of Planning. Okay. Um
on that note, we are moved, we are seconded. Oh, Councillor Dot, you did come in, so apologies for that. So over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, most of the things being said and discussed, uh, there are several concerns about uh, this proposal of 32 residential units. For example, loss of lights to neighbor, insufficient landscaping, overlooking, so many things. Uh, I'm not completely satisfied with the information provided by the applicant. For example, there's uh, uncertainty about the plan uh, parking. Uh, as mentioned in the uh, page 100, uh, 164 uh, in the officer's report, uh, stacky, stacker parking racks, they are, as mentioned, they are mechanical device. And what, what's going, what are the alternative arrangements if this fails? So it's gonna put extra strain on the on-street parking. So what are the proposal about it? So, so these kind of stuff, I'm not very satisfied and I'm very happy to support the officer's recommendation for that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Dot. I think James has found something. I think it's co contrary to policy D6 criteria uh, E on page 133 of the London Plan. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure, James, you memorised it, but. Um, Sorry, criteria E, I think I might have said D. It's criteria E on page 133. Okay, thank you, Councillor Dot, for your, for your input there as well. Um, Alan Tilly, did you want to make a point? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I take your point about the uh, stackers. They are mechanical devices and they may break down. Uh, to protect the council, uh, sorry, the residents, for the event of these uh, devices, the stackers breaking down, we do ask for a uh, management plan, a maintenance plan, should I say. So we make sure that when the stackers are provided, they've got a proper strategy for them being maintained so that they don't break down. And if they do so, that they're quickly repaired. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, through you, Chairman. Uh, w w what's gonna happen if they fail to abide by the contract? Uh, in, in what condition? What are the planning obligations? Um, well, there's a car parking management scheme around the area, so they wouldn't be able to park anywhere nearby. Um, on the roads because there is a car parking management scheme so they'd have to really want to park they'll have to travel quite a lot further so but then I suppose they could do that anyway so I think th there is a mechanism to try and limit that I mean there's a question of it's four how many three four spaces I don't think we could probably justify that that's going to put like significant undue pressure on the highway network for four cars in the event that it did fail. So we'll, we'll be on sticking ground. I'm sure they could get four cars in at one level, but maybe if there was a mechanical failure. I just think, yeah, it, it, we, I wouldn't want to go to appeal to try and defend <laughs> that issue, yeah. Um, and if it was allowed, we would request in the appeal statement that this is either managed by, no, by a 106, so there's a commitment from the applicant and it runs with the land so it doesn't just disappear uh, when conditions expire, yeah. Okay, thank you everybody for your input there. I'm not seeing any other members indicate we are moved, we are seconded. Um, can I have a uh, show of hands for the officer's recommendation? So that's unanimous, Steve. Yep. So I can confirm this evening, agenda item eight is refused. Thank you very much for everybody for your participation in that. Okay, we can now move on to the next agenda item, uh, which isn't covered by a petition, so we've dealt with all our petition items this evening, which is agenda item nine, Marriott Hotel, Bath Road, Heathrow. Mandy, are you taking on this, on this one? I am, thank you, Excellent. Chairman. I'm taking the rest of the, the items. So agenda item nine is the Marriott Hotel. This is the proposal for the construction of a part five and part six story building immediately to the west of the existing hotel. So on screen you can see the location of the existing hotel in red on the location plan. The new hotel located, bring up a post site plan. So this is the existing block plan and the existing landscaping plan. So there is a large car parking area which serves the existing Marriott Hotel. And if we look at the proposed block plan, I'm not sure if it's 100% clear, but the new hotel 
will be an L-shaped building built in the position of some of the car parking area that serves the existing Marriott Hotel. The new hotel that goes through the general arrangement is a very small basement. At ground floor level, there is a, we, we push for the, re the reception or entrance area to be more inviting and along the street frontage of Bath Road. Um, and the remainder of the hotel as we go up the building is um, a restaurant. I was going to call it a canteen, but it's definitely a restaurant. Um, and then additional hotel bedrooms going along the rear of the site. And that arrangement continues along uh, all the way up the building. You will notice that there are some um, zigzags on this side of the elevation, and those are oriel windows, and that's to prevent the overlooking into the residential properties which do surround the site um, over to the west. So the oriel windows carry on up the building, um, but the building is then set in at the upper four levels of the fourth floor. Um, so I hope you can see that. So that's the white strip along this section, and that's to, in order to reduce the mass of the building as we climb up. And that's the fifth floor level. There is additional height along the Bath Road frontage where you can accommodate the additional um, height. This is the general arrangement of the roof. These are the north and southwest elevations as proposed. So you can, you can see where the building has been stepped here. And I'm not sure if it's entirely clear that those are Oriel window, so that means that that is a blank facade that you cannot see out of, and the windows are actually small slits which face in an orientation away from the residential properties. There are probably CGIs that demonstrate that a little bit better. So this is the top image is the front elevation of the property along Bath Road, so providing um, some interesting frontage along the Bath Road um, and the yellow areas denote those um, those key communal spaces so that would be the restaurant and the main hotel entrance I will take you through um, the planting plan so there is a green screen and buffer which is mentioned in the committee report proposed and that's in order to provide some relief to the existing residents um, which are to the west we have planting plans again we I I'm almost 100%, 99% certain there's pollution absorbing trees in the condition. And if there isn't, there will be. Um, I'll take you through some bird's eye views. So this is the existing Marriott Hotel. It does have a nice or a, a green street frontage. And we have sought to extend that through um, to the proposed building. So the green buffer along the Bath Road will continue along um, in front of the new building, which will actually be in the position of these car parking spaces. Now we are building on the car parking spaces within the Marriott Hotel site. The car parking has been through a full assessment of its usage. So one of the things that's mentioned is that, yes, there is a reduction of uh, a quantum of car parking in order to facilitate the new hotel. However, the car parking is not always 100% operational and therefore it's acceptable to have a, a quantum of loss. This is robustly supported by um, further work for a travel plan, uh, which is part of the recommendations on page 178. So again, there are sustainable measures being implemented in order to deliver um, less car parking but more sustainable travel. These are the existing properties um, on Triumph Close. It's important to note that whilst the relationship on plan form, which I might have pointed out earlier, looks quite close. There is actually an access road and then there are garages between the hotel and these properties on Triumph Close. So in plan it looks probably quite close but there is actually already an existing buffer. Ex again, neighbouring properties. So the application is recommended for approval. Uh, the package of section 106 is set out on page 178 and there are a suite of conditions. One of the conditions I wanted to draw your attention to was the refuse management plan. So there is, it's not called the refuse management plan, which is probably why it would confuse you. Condition number 11 deals with deliveries and servicing. So refuse is part of deliveries and servicing to a hotel such as this. Some of the things we've done is to try and secure measures to minimize as far as reasonably practical vehicle movements and activities along the servicing um, 
Road in order to minimise the impact on the residential properties uh, adjoining the site. And that's because, if I take you back to the plan, servicing does take place... Uh, let me take you back. So servicing will take place in this area here um, and therefore does potentially have an impact on these residents. That is the reason why we've tried to secure the green buffer. Um, the noise impact assessment does recommend that um, conditions are imposed and that is what we have done. Uh, again, there is also the garages between the site and an internal access road. So we've done as much as we reasonably can, I think, with this application. Uh, there are... The application is recommended for approval. I'll pass back to the chairman. Thank you for that, uh, and it, we've got no uh, petition or speakers on this one, so we can go straight to members. Uh, Councillor Cawthorn, you indicated. Yeah, I did. Um, three fairly quick points, I hope. Um, top of page 205, uh, we talk about the scheme not being considered in accordance with the local plan. Now, clearly, we don't depart from planning policy lightly, and obviously the sequential test has been referred to. Uh, just interested in understanding that a little bit more fully if I can, because presumably be to go into the question of alternative site assessments, you need to start with an agreed need, an identified need, uh, to support that. Um, I just want to be clear that we've done that. Uh, that's my first question. Second one is around um, the, let me see, page 202, um, concerns raised by um, Heathrow Airport Limited around uh, conditions being needed. I just want to be satisfied that they, they have been addressed. Are we to understand that they're happy now? That's my second question. And the final one for me is the, um, the level of park, car parking be, being reduced. We hear on page 203 that TfL strongly recommend that that's reduced further. And we heard earlier that, um, you know, uh, we heard earlier that the um, the requirements of the GLA trump local considerations. So I'm just wondering whether we should be concerned about that at all in this context. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, three points there. Mandy, you're okay to pick them up? I am. Now, Councillor Cawthorn, you're completely right insofar as the application is, in technical terms, a departure because this is not a preferred location for hotel development. Now, you'll recall through our local plan a few years ago, the Bath Road was actually allocated as suitable for the delivery of hotel accommodation to serve Heathrow Airport. However, the planning inspector, um, or the planning inspector for our inquiry, asked us or directed us to remove that allocation. So, for technical reasons, well, whereas we have always permitted hotel development along the Bath Road to support Heathrow Airport, it then became a departure because we removed the the support or the allocation or designation for hotel development along the Bath Road. We have, however, robustly been through an appraisal of adjoining boroughs and town centres, which are the preferable locations for hotel development, and there isn't sufficient sites or there aren't sufficient sites in, we've assessed Hounslow, Slough, I apologise, I don't know exactly which boroughs, but we have taken a, a distance criteria of which town centres to assess. So it wasn't just the London Borough of Hillingdon town centres. We have assessed whether there are appropriate sites in other boroughs. There aren't, and therefore this passes its, its sequential test. Um, so in technical terms, yes, it's a departure. However, it has passed the sequential test and therefore is acceptable. Um, Heathrow conditions have been included, so they are generally bird hazard management plans, mitigation for radar, um, and so on. So they should be set out in full from pages 179 onwards. On car parking, there is a reduction and there is a fine balance between our parking, what we feel our local parking needs and the London plan and TfL's requirement for us to be car free and 100% sustainable. But we aren't a borough that have fantastic links. We have good links. Um, and there is a need for us to understand that people will travel to the hotel by car and by coach, and therefore we're facilitating that by retaining a quantum of parking on site. And that's also to avoid detriment to the local residents, because there are local residents around here, and to avoid the overspill of visitors parking in Triumph Close and the surrounding areas. 
So yes, there is a fine, stripe, a fine balance to be struck, but we're not going as far as TfL want, but we're content that we're going as far as we need to. Councillor Cawthorn, are you okay with that? Good, okay, thank you. Well, I've got Councillor Higgins followed by Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Chairman. It's always good not to go agree with GLA anyway, but we've got the wrong thing. Anyway, anyway I'll, I'll digress. Um, just got one question, really. I didn't really want to have a question, but unfortunately seeing the diagrams. Overlooking um, between the Marriott Hotel and the new hotel, there is a stairwell with glass in it, so there could be a possibility of overlooking into the bedrooms, but I'm not sure if that those are windows down that side. And if they're not, then so it's to the to the right hand side. Yeah, there. There's wind. There must be windows there, isn't there? Sure. And that. You are completely right in so far as there is an element of overlooking between the two buildings. Uh, we, in, however, there are no policy requirements for hotel rooms to have a set separation distance. So we have gone as far as creating separation that we feel is adequate for transient users. Um, and we did, we focused more on the policy that we have to support um, prevent overlooking to the residents over to the west. So our focus, based on the policy tests, was for our residents as opposed to the transient users of the existing Marriott Hotel. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. Councillor Duncan. Um, yes, just following on from the point that Councillor Cawthorn made about going through the sequential test, I thought there was also um, a requirement in plan terms that we did provide hotel accommodation and um, that at one point we were short of this and we needed to provide more so um, although it may not be fulfilling one requirement I understand that it, it may be fulfilling another requirement mm -hmm. I could just ask that please. Mind it? I am sorry, Councillor Cawthorn, I did not answer your question fully. Yes, we do have a requirement under the London plan to deliver a certain quantum of hotel bedrooms and hotel accommodation. So yes, we are definitely meeting that need, but it's not in the sequentially preferable location of a town centre. I propose officer's recommendation. Okay, no, thank you, that Councillor Duncan. Okay, so I'm looking at Councillor Cawthorn, you seconding? Okay, good, right, we're moved and seconded. All those in favour of officer's recommendation? I'll make that unanimous, Steve, yeah? Yep. So I can confirm that this evening, agenda item nine is approved. Thank you very much, everybody. We can move on to agenda item 10 now, which is uh, Millington Road Hayes, which some members will um, be familiar with as it's been in front of us a couple of times, I think. So, uh, hand it. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, councillors, um, will be familiar with the site. I believe it's only it went to planning committee late last year. So we, we already have a prior approval on this site to grant permission for 114 flats. This application seeks consent for, seeks prior approval for 113 flats. So it's been reduced by one. Again, I will draw your attention to page 240, where it's set out quite clearly the material planning considerations that we can consider when looking at prior approval applications for a change of use from the offices to uh, residential accommodation. So we are quite limited and hamstrung in what we can consider. We have obviously made favorable recommendations in the past. And in this instance, we are again making a, a positive recommendation that prior approval is required but is granted for the 113 residential units. We have acknowledged that there is a need to improve the the um, walking and cycling experience from the application site to Hayes and Harlington station which is being upgraded to a, um, a crossrail station so you'll see in the heads of terms that condition uh, obligation number four is again seeking the same obligations uh, for improvements towards the safety and convenience of occupiers for safe walking and cycling to the station the application is reluctantly recommended for approval but we do have some benefits from this prior approval Thank you, Mandip. Uh, Councillor Higgins. Yeah, I'll go, I, if, as Mandip summed it up just perfect, that last sentence, but I will go with officer's recommendation. Thank you, 
Councillor Higgins, Councillor Duncan. I propose it. Yes, it is already a prior approval. I think we've seen this before. I will second it, Chair. Thank you. Okay, we are moved and seconded. Can I have a show of hands, please? Okay, that's unanimously for approving agenda item 10 this evening. Okay, so we can now move on to agenda item 11, which is uh, Ashley Road, Uxbridge Industrial Park. Mandit? Thank you. Apologies, the last item I forgot to go through the slides. Um, but the, you've seen the drawings before. <laughs> Item 11 is the Uxbridge Industrial Estate at Ashley Road. The application site um, has been to planning committee a few years ago, and that was for the redevelopment of the site to provide three uh, state-of-the-art, how you would rephrase them, um, commercial sheds. So this is the application site outlined in blue. It has permission to be used for, B1, for a range of B uses, and the site is within an industrial area. So it was an acceptable land use. The site was redeveloped and the, the wider site then included these units here. So it was comprehensively redeveloped. These are fairly new um, buildings. We have uh, the docking bays to serve the properties, parking for staff. But this application site is currently occupied um, and in operation. The application seeks a temporary planning permission for two years to provide, get to the right slide, a small external, we're going to call it a marquee, um, but I'm sure it has a, a proper name. So it's a temporary structure for two years that will provide additional accommodation um, for the users of the property. There is a subsidiary um, unit just located here within the, the yard, and that's providing ancillary office space. Now, the reason for the, the application is, is stated to be to provide additional uh, space for social distancing during uh, the pandemic. I fully appreciate that we are coming towards what we hope is the end. Um, they initially wanted a five-year temporary permission. We said that was excessive, let's be positive, and we only need it for two years. Um, so we are only granting a two-year temporary permission for the marquee structure and these double-stacked internal cabins, which will be used for offices. So it, it's not an insubstantial um, structure. It, is going to be located within the yard. But one of the things to point out is that the loading bays, whilst the loading bays within the area in front of the marquee would not become operational, there remain enough um, bays, as stated by the applicants in their own statements, to service the existing facility and the existing units. So there will still be loading bays here and loading bays here. I note that this building here um, was initially actually taking up a number of car parking spaces. Um, personally, I didn't really want um, a loss of car parking because that then leads to additional parking on street. So they have moved it into the yard, which is here. Now, there's, there's the obvious question of, well, can vehicles actually still access these um, loading bays? If it was a larger vehicle, I would assume they would use the docking bays, which are closer and unobstructed, and potentially smaller vehicles would use the additional parking bays, which need to navigate the internal, um, the internal double-stacked offices. So it's a trade-off. We were either in a position, the initial plans showed the, the blue buildings in the car parking, and it's not an ideal scenario to lose further car parking. Um, if you'll know Wallingford Road, it's um, hazardous, hazardous at best is a way to describe the road um, surface. So let's, I, I don't think offsetting the parking onto the high road was, was the best move. So the application is recommended for approval. We will take you through some photographs. So these are the new buildings which have been constructed. You can see the docking bays. So this will be where the temporary offices are and the marquee structure will be centrally located. Again, there are cars already parked on street, so there clearly is a, a, a demand for having um, car parking. The application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mandip. Uh, Councillor Higgins? I'll take this away. I'll go with officer's recommendation on this. It's, it's, everything's been explained very well, Mandip. Thank you very much. And I'll propose it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Duncan? Yes, I mean, if it's needed to provide safer COVID safe conditions for staff, then uh, I 
think that we should appreciate that they are trying to do something. I will second it. Okay, no, thank you. Question I had, and this might be for Alan actually, um, we've got a marquee, whatever it's going to be called, I know these marquees can be quite rigid. How's, how's that structure going to be protected if we've got vehicles moving around it? Have we got any information on that? Um, that's a good point, Chairman. Um, I haven't got any details on how it would be protected. Um, some ideas could be bollards strategically placed. Um, on that, having said that, hopefully it's big enough and clear enough not to be missed. But of course, if it is hit, people might be vulnerable inside. So yes, I think we can investigate whether bollards would help uh, protect the people inside. Thank you, Chairman. I don't know, any other members got any uh, views on that? Councillor Higgins? Through you, Chairman. Yeah, just make it yellow, bright yellow, and then everybody can see it. And then that would be fine. I think, they're gonna, I think people that are going to be using the site should actually will know that there is something there. And uh, just remind me. So I would hope common sense will prevail. I, I guess they'll have their own yard risk assessment. Yes, and, exactly. And all those so kind I of things. I think we can so, okay. uh, all right. let them do that. Good. Right, we are moved and seconded on this one. All those in favour? Steve, I'll make that unanimous. So agenda item 11 this evening is approved. Thank you very much. So that brings us now to the last item. And it has been a lengthy meeting, so uh, we'll give this one um, all of our attention as it is the last item, which is agenda item 12, Morrison Supermarket. And again, some members will re recall this one, including the site visit a couple of years ago. So, uh, Mandip. Thank you, Chairman. Agenda item 12 is actually a deed of variation to an approved legal agreement. So the application already has planning permission. Uh, we it was granted uh, some time ago. We have affordable housing proposed on site. The affordable housing that we have secured in the current legal agreement comprises of a total of 42 units. And that is a mix of London affordable rent units, London living rent units, and London shared ownership units. This current application, which is being uh, in the process of being negotiated to be implemented, the affordable housing provider is seeking to amend the mix of the units that are being delivered on site. So we don't lose any units of affordable housing. It will always be 42 affordable properties, but they will now be, they are proposed to be provided as 38 London affordable rent and four London shared ownership. They will, there will therefore be no London living rent proposed within this scheme. The housing officer has reviewed the application and considers that the proposed tenure split is better than we actually secured originally. So in that respect, the application is supported, especially insofar as there is no reduction. There is also a, requ uh, a request under the second part of this variation to include a mortgagee in possession clause. We've seen quite a few applications at planning committee recently to include the mortgagee in possession, so that it's quite good that this one's rolling it into one. Um, so the application is recommended for approval. I have a pretty photograph of the Morrison store, but we do also have the proposed tenure plans, which will be, <laughs> which will be updated. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, yeah. thank so, you, Mandy. So I think James just a make quick a point. point. Uh, obviously, some members may realise that the recent AGM, uh, you did agree to change the delegated authority, so we didn't need to take the mortgagee and possession reports to committee. But obviously, this one's changing the affordable housing mix, so we, uh, he 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 hence the report. Okay, I've got Councillor Higgins and Councillor. Well Duncan. done, James, because I was just about to jump on that one. But anyway, yeah, no, um, I'm, I'm quite happy with this. I'll go with officer recommendation. I mean, I like we've had this before where uh, someone's come back and uh, this, the assessment has been what's the need is needed in that area, which I'm happy to go with. So I'll propose that. No, thank you, Councillor Higgins. Councillor Duncan? Yes, I second it. And I'm pleased that the, um, the housing provision is actually improved. Thank you. Okay, right, we are moved and seconded. Can I have a show of hands, please, for members? That's unanimous for approval, Steve. Okay, right, that brings us to the end of... Uh, quite a long meeting actually so for those watching us on YouTube uh, and for members and officers that have supported us this evening and indeed other participants um, I bid you all a good evening thank you very much